welcome back, Screamers, to another episode of Post-Marxist Third Generation Feminist Apocrypha or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Today, that was a deep cut, right? (laughs) Today, we're talking Hal Hartley's Henry Fool trilogy and the new film, The Zone of Interest. So, um, you know. We're going out of order. Yes. We're going out of order. Um, Which is probably the best way to do it. It was a good idea, <clears throat> for yeah, sure. To put to put these three together. Yeah. And, and, yeah, yeah. I don't know how well they line up with the zone of interest, but. <laughs> I don't know how well anything <laughs> lines up with zone of interest. Um, like, I'm, like, I'm interested to hear your take on this. I film. mean, it. look, I, I really enjoy Glazer's work. And I, I think uh, that this is, it, it is probably, I would say, a very important film and one that everyone needs to see and I will never watch it again. Like, I don't, I don't think I'll ever go back to it unless I'm, as I'm introducing someone to it or someone really wants to see it. But I, this is not something that I want to like partake in again. Okay. Why? I mean, it's just so fucking heavy, right? I mean, it's just all in all of these Holocaust comedies that we watch are, are just so, <laughs> <laughs> I'm obviously kidding. Uh, all these Holocaust movies, and they're not all the same. And I think Glazer has a really interesting take and an artistic take. Um, some of the things he's doing with sound and the visuals is, are really um, amazing. Um, but ultimately, I get his point. I don't know if this is a world I want to spend a whole hell of a lot of time in. Right. right. And um, and I, not, you know it, that. I think the message was clear and uh, then I, yeah, I, I get it and I understand. And, it, and well, how many, I mean, how many more Holocaust movies do you think we need? And I don't mean, I, I'm not, and I'm not trying to be like glib or funny here, but I think he has an interesting take. I think this is, a, this is an interesting take on, on this, on the story. And I think it does relate to, uh, you know, our, our current day, um, okay. Okay. Good. So I, I do think that it's, I do think this actually film is actually necessary because I do think that especially, you know, one, we're having such a conversation uh, around what anti-Semitism is and what genocide is. I mean, it's a fucking weird conversation just in regards to the Palestinian conflict that's going on and it has been going on, but it's really escalated. Um, I, so I think that this and it, it's really interesting that this came along at this particular point in time. Not that just coincidental, I'm sure, but um, it's a marketing campaign. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, they're getting the the, the, I, the Hollywood I, dollars I, are rough I, there, so they've got to fucking really ramp up how they get you get butts into the seats. Um, but I do think it's it's it is relevant to how we deal with things today. And of course, as the film goes on and it and it flash forwards to forward day Auschwitz, it's um, that is a really powerful statement that that film makes. Yeah, all about. yeah, well, I was waiting for you to stop <laughs> Waiting for me to fucking so, to stop talking. The, the, the Zone of Interest tells the story of the, the Commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Haas, and his family Hedwig strive to build a dream life for their family in a house and garden next to the camp. I yeah. mean, that's it, right? This family, this family lives right next to Auschwitz, and it's a normal Nazi family. Yeah. I mean, they they do Nazi things. I mean, this <laughs> is this is and... loosely based on Martin Amos's novel of the same name. I say loosely because there was so much, so much of um, Amos's book. I mean, is not in the film, right? Right. Um, I, I think he had like multiple sort of threads and narrators in there, and Amos fictionalizes Rudolf Haas, where Glazer opts to base the film on real people, right? Right. Um, 
Uh, did you look into Haas at all? I did not know much about this guy other than like he was there. At 15, he fought with the Ottoman Sixth Army in World War I. Wow. Um, and by all accounts, he was there during and witnessed the Armenian genocide and the Assyrian genocide during that time. I mean, and there's more right, there. Right, I mean, right, like, yeah. you know, he was like the, I think the youngest, like, non-commissioned officer at 17 years old. But like a horrible, like, life to live, right? I know, I, mean, I know. All of these, like, the, the worst accolades you could possibly have yeah. on your resume. Right, but then, like, by, by all other sort of testimonies and sort of, um, you know, written accounts, this guy was pretty much, like, how he was portrayed. Very kind of apathetic. Right. Right emotionless like yeah he's like well i think uh you know i think 2.5 million is wrong and i don't think i killed more than like 1.3 and you're like right what the fuck dude so <laughs> yeah it, it that the movie does an interesting um it it does portray at times people that come into house's life and house's family's life uh that are appalled or just not able to reconcile um, the horrors that are going on. And it, that's, I think that's an interesting take. I, whether or not how much validity, I mean, it's difficult cause I'm not Jewish and, and like, so I don't know, like going into this, how much humanity you want to give to this, um, regime. And so having, but you had to have known like, and, and obviously we do this as well. Um, where removed from direct proximity, to the horrors you can ignore them and when the screaming is right outside your window every night and you can see the flames lighting up your room um then then it becomes way more real and you may not be able to handle the the horrors that are going on yeah i mean this is in reference to um hedwig's mother who comes to visit and one night the ovens are going and you see the flames and the ash and she it wakes her up um from sleep and she looks out the window and the next day she's gone and she just like leaves, doesn't tell anybody, just just <laughs> right. gets out. And before that, they had this like big garden party. And before that, she, you know, made these comments about uh, the Jewish woman she used to work for or the Jewish woman who out who outbid her on doing sort of, you know, curtains and, and upholstery for someone else. And sort of with these like dismissive, like, right, you know, very kind of nonchalantly disdainful comments. And then, yeah, in the middle of the night, it's like, oh, I can't do this. I can't be around. Right, and it, it 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 does a really good job of highlighting the banality of their lives yeah. while all of this is going on, and and how they normalize their racism and yeah. and 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 attitude towards the Jewish people to the point where I mean, obviously they're dehumanized, but their children in, uh, intentionally. Uh, in, you know, invoke havoc in the camps by she places her, you know, one of his daughters places apples in the middle of the night. That's not his daughter. That no. was a daughter. Oh no. Okay. So let's, um, let me come to that. So okay. that is actually, that character is based off someone that Glazier met in real life. Um, he met this woman named Alexa Alexandria and she was 90 years old when they met. She was part of the Polish resistance. And what she would do is she would put food there for the workers, right? Because they they didn't get much. Right. Right. And you even hear one story of two prisoners fighting over an apple. See, and that's where I thought she was doing it to, yeah. to make it like, I thought that she was fucking with them. I thought the whole idea mm -hmm. was that she was placing the apples out there. And so that they knew that they would fight. Right. Yeah, no, it's they like would, nourishment. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I was like, yeah, it was like extra nourishment. Yeah. And she, so she was part of the Polish resistance. Wow. Um, the bicycle that the character rode mm -hmm. and the dress that character wore belonged to her. Wow. Belonged to this real woman. Yeah. Um, and she died, I think, like right before the movie came out. But you know how she finds the song mm -hmm. um, and then she goes home and she plays it. That really happened. And that guy actually made it out, like survived. Oh, really? So, yeah. So this goes, I think, to show how much research Glazer did into all this stuff. Um, but yeah, like that was that was real. What was your take on the kind of the more surrealistic aspects well, with the sound, kind of yeah, playing with the sound. I, and... I really, I, I liked it for the kind of haunting atmosphere mm -hmm. I think it provided. Um, and I liked how he shot those scenes with, with the girl, with that like thermal imaging camera. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think, and I think the movie tells us what it's going to do with sound like right away. Right. Because it opens up with this like black screen and then this 
kind of like haunting music. Right. Um, I, I had a thought when I was watching it. I was kind of like, this feels like a little Dune ish. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so that took me out a little bit, but overall, I, I did like it. Um, speaking of sound, I guess the sound designer had like a 600 page, I don't know, dossier book or whatever with um, a list of like real events and testimonies and then a map to figure out how things should sound. Wow. Like when we hear them and like, oh, this would have happened here. Right. Right. So it should sound like this on screen. Yeah. I mean, the layers, right. And the sound, I mean, the sound is like a different film completely. Right. Right. And it's like the film we don't see. Which, which I thought was really Did it cool. get nominated? I don't even know if it got I mean, I know it got best nominated for Best Picture, but did it get anything else like technical? I don't know. Yeah, because it should. Yeah, it really, really um, should. Um, it should. And I thought the editing was really, was really good. Yeah. Um, the house scenes. So I was looking, I was, I was watching it. I'm cu- I was curious, like, okay, what did, he, what did he shoot this on? So he shot it with digital cameras. But the cameras are made to like mimic 35 millimeter. And then he shot with Leica lenses. So the color and the sharpness is there. Mm -hmm. Um, But, but they also put like 10 cameras in the house and just kept them running Hmm. with like nobody there. (laughs) And then he encouraged people to sort of, I would love this time. I know. I know. Just be like, like, (laughs) just go. Right. Cause there is no, (laughs) right. (laughs) She's like, now, now how many, how many feet would that be? Right. (laughs) Like, can I hide these hard drives in my garage? <laughs> right. But he, so, so Glacier just had these cameras running, right? And nobody, with, with no crew present. And he would have, he encouraged the actors to kind of improv a little bit or experiment. And he called it, what did he, wait, I wrote this down. He called this Big Brother in the Nazi House. <laughs> That's the TV series it's coming I, out. Um, yeah, that'll be great. <laughs> Um, you know, it, it does a really, I, I think it, you know, it does a really good job of, of, because there's, it, it, it juxtaposes like the efficiency experts that come in and propose the oven methodology of always keeping an oven burning and like being the, able to the circular, right. <laughs> so fucking cre- creepy and crazy. And like, just with the, like you said, I mean, just the emotionlessness of, and like, of of just those actions but then you also see um you know them joking about basically taking heirlooms and and wealth away from the jews that, that, that as they captured them hiding diamonds in the toothpaste and then of course like at one point Haas is about to be transferred out of Auschwitz because he spent his time there and his wife is like we're not leaving <laughs> like we're just going to stay here because we built a home here but her like inhumanity of, of one kind of doling out the things that she didn't want out to her, all the other wives of the, of the, of the camp and, and the servants. Right. Right. And then, yeah, then, then talking about bidding on auctions and of, of dra- draperies that, yeah. that they've stolen from the Jewish people. It, I, I think that's one of the things like you, you, there have been films about the horrors, obviously, and, and films that are inside camps um, I think this is an interesting take. I mean, I really have like kind of peeling back the layers and the things that, that um, went on around, but weren't talked about cause they're not the main, they're not the main whore, but just the inhumanity that, that existed and had to exist to have these absolute, you know, this, this thing happen. You know, it's crazy. Well, you, and you said it earlier when you said the banality of the everyday, I mean, this goes back to, you know, Hannah Arendt's, you know, work, the banality of evil and, and how this family, right. Doesn't just espouse that. In fact, they don't say much of anything, but they live this out. Right. No one is there in that family. No one is there like preaching. I mean, they don't, they don't really hardly say anything about Jewish people at all. Right. But they're living this. I mean, they are embodying that kind of hatred, right? They are, they are embodying the sort of Nazi manifesto <coughs> right? in their everydayness. And, and Haas's wife speaks about, this has always been their dream, right? This, right. this, this has right. been like, we're not leaving this. This is, this is the life that we dreamt of when we were young, when we were 17. <laughs> it's like, Fuck and fuck. That's yeah. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I think it's effective because of what we don't see and we know what's there. Right, right, right. And we're sort of watching this happen and just go, how can people do this? How can people live their life 
and the boring everydayness when this atrocity is happening right next right next door literally right next door and you can hear the gunshots and nobody and the screams i mean like and and, and they're not so overpowering they're just like you said with the sound right. it's just right. they're faint but they're still there yeah okay I, so we brought this up now i want to i want to i want to i'm usually a fan of the critic manola darkest mm-hmm. but she hated this movie. Really? Yeah. She, I mean, absolutely hated it. And so I would like to read you some things. <laughs> and, and then I would like your response. Well, and I, I mean, I kind of want to dig into this idea too. Sure, sure, sure. So this is what Dargis, Dargis says. What is the point of the zone of interest? I've seen Jonathan Glazer's movie twice, and each time I return to this question, something that I really rarely feel compelled to ask. Movies exist because someone needs to needs or wants to make art, tell a story, drive home a point, defend a cause, expose a wrong, or simply make money. All that is clear from what's on screen is Glazer has made a hollow, self-aggrandizing art film exercise set in Auschwitz during the Holocaust. All right, I have more. <laughs> <laughs> and then she continues. I'm taking it in. In adapting the novel, Glazer has jettisoned much of Amos's novel, most of its characters, plot lines, and inventive, at times, near-hysteric language and tone. Because well, that's what you do when you adapt. Right. What Glazer has retained is the novel's intimate juxtaposition between the horrors of the extermination camp and the everyday lives of, 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 its, non, of its non-inmate characters. Unlike Amos, however, who routinely invokes and at times describes the barbarism Barbarism inside the camp <laughs> with its daily berm of corpses, as he writes. Glazer significantly and pointedly keeps these horrors at an oblique remove. Right, but that's the fucking point. That's, but right, that I, I, is I, the I, point, I, I feel, right? I feel, like, I, feel, I feel like self-aggrandizing is a little bit... I like I, that's a that you're putting something on Glazer that that's yeah. not really there. Like, the, like he's patting himself on the back for telling this story. I, th- look. Okay, so had he not have flash forward to present day Auschwitz, then maybe she has a point. Maybe, maybe because again, the movie has no point at that point. I mean, like, you know, because then it is just home improvement next to Auschwitz, right? It's just, it's just a, it's not funny. It's just not, not the home improvement was funny, but it, it's yeah, a was sitcom, right? It's a sitcom next, and it's of course. I mean, I, I say that it's not. It is just a story, right? There's not, there's no plot here. This is about, right, I mean, like right. there's some, there's some through lines of, of Haas. But there I, doesn't need to, I, I mean, I, so this is interesting because I was thinking about story too. And like this word story and how we throw around story and like story <laughs> right. has to mean like, you know, a, well, look, three acts like, and yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm like, I, character growth I, and what I hate that idea. Right. And I think this is a film that eschews that it's like, this is like a meandering kind of everyday right. life. So like, yeah, so there doesn't need to be, and we've talked about this and how, like, I don't really care about plot, right? Ebert sure. does, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> I'll let you deal with that. So, um, yeah, so, like, I don't think there needs to be a story, and I, I largely agree with her on films. Um, and so I'm really surprised by this because I thought we were kind of simpatico. <laughs> Me and Manola. <laughs> well, I mean, th- this sounds like someone who was in love with Amos's novel and then went in with the expectation yeah. that it didn't translate to the screen. And I think, I think what Glazer does here is is brilliant in the sense that if we're just telling a Holocaust story, then I think her point is valid of saying, why are we telling this story again? And again, I don't. But it's I not mean, that we. It's something we need to shy away from, n- even retelling. Um, and, and maybe there's validity in, in in introducing new art that revisits old art because we need to remind ourselves and new generations and that wouldn't go out and seek out the old art mm-hmm. that this was this something that was that was real and it happened and it was horrific and we need to come to grips with that and not and only come to grips but also remember it and and to not repeat it. Um, so I think there's validity in all of that. But I, but I, I think she, I, like I said, this seems like she wanted something different, and because she came into it with the expectations of, well, I read something, I read this, and that it's not the thing that I thought it was. And be. it's about the Holocaust, so where's the Holocaust? Right, right. I mean, because that's so. Like when I was, <clears throat> right. This is when, not Schindler's List. There's no like uplifting. Like you leave the way Glazer intends you to leave. Right. You leave kind of devastated. 
and and look, I mean, I know there's other Holocaust films that leave you devastated, but, but in a different way, right, right, right. I mean, like Schindler, Schindler's List leaves you devastated in a different way, right, right, right. Um, when I said like, how many more Holocaust movies do we need? It six. wasn't, I know, right? Just well, <laughs> six and a half. It wasn't that I think we need to stop talking about it, right? Or just be of like, course. okay, like we've seen that and that's over. But I think. What I meant was, how many more Holocaust movies do we need to see that all we see is the camp and the sort of destruction of right. people, right? And not, okay, I want to I bring this up because I was just going to say, you know, we're seeing the people that did this, did the, the sort of heinous acts, right? We have sort of pilloried Scorsese for glorifying kind of evil, Right. And in a different way, that was one of my problems with Saltburn, too, Mm -hmm. right? Where we're sort of, even though we're making fun of these rich people and we kill them all, we just take their place because that's what we want. We all want to do that, right? So glorifying these kind of lifestyles. Is there a danger of that happening here? Right? And what I mean is like Scorsese going like, well, obviously this is bad. You don't (laughs) need me to tell you it's bad, right? I mean, is there kind of... I... Maybe I, I I don't I'm not that he's glorifying Nazis, but you know what I mean, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I get. I understand. I'm I'm trying to to apply it to this film. Um, I don't see that. Well, I mean, like, there's enough of the horrors, right? I think I think there's enough. Like, I I think we the the audience stand in are, are the character. I mean, to a certain extent, the characters that leave, the characters that come and leave, and are allowed to ignore it. Right. I think that that's a different enough take to um, because I don't think that there's really anything glamorous or her, there's no heroic arc where you where the, it is in Scorsese's films. There's no right, heroic right. arc for House. He doesn't come to the realization that what he's doing is wrong ever. I mean, like any. Well, in his he, so he wrote his memoirs when he was in prison mm. and he pretty much like blames everyone else. Right. Right. I mean, as these guys he was just following orders, exactly. Right? He right. was just a cog. And, and <laughs> he was, if, if not him, who, and if right. not, then right. when, right. <laughs> not where so. <laughs> if not he was, where. he was a devout Catholic and then left the church. Like after he, you know, joined the Nazi party and then rejoined the church, you know, as I think people do when they're getting ready to be hanged. <laughs> right. right. When you need a good defense lawyer. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and, and he wrote letters to his son sort of saying, don't follow blindly like I did. Anyway, I'm not defending this guy. I'm just saying that, like, you know, I think as people like this, as we saw so many, or as we see people in these positions do, they will come out and go, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I'm sorry. Does that help? You know, right. and, and like, no, it doesn't. Right? <clears throat> and, and we don't ever see that in the film either. I, and again, I don't think <clears throat> that the moment that we, and we, I keep dancing around it, we, the moment that we flash forward. So he's... Yeah. Um, you know, he has a moment where he's walking through Auschwitz and we see Auschwitz in present day. And we see basically the keepers of Auschwitz tidying up, um, and, you know, dusting, vacuuming. It's become a museum. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And. Or memorial. There's a banality around these people. And again, nothing against these folks. Right. I mean, you couldn't work that. You have to work a job, right? Everyone has to make a living. Um, but the fact that we've turned this into a spot where people buy tickets and there, I don't know if there's a gift shop at Auschwitz, but, um, right. But, but, and, right. and I don't mean to, I don't mean to say that flip. No, 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 either. no. But you're, but you're pointing out the sort of cynicism around these things around right. the sort of like spectacle. I mean, of, we've seen it too with the fucking influencers and people that are dumbasses yeah. that go and, and take pictures. Like it's a fucking like, Oh, look at me kind of thing. Or they do the same thing at Anne Frank's house. I mean, it's just like, we, we don't know how to have the, um, and I will say even on a personal level, cause I've been to, uh, the Holocaust museum in, in Israel, uh, in, in Jerusalem, it's not, it, there's a gallows type humor that exists there too. Like <laughs> the story I tell is that I went on a tour, um, with people. It was a day long, like just a different, you know, we went to different uh, biblical sites and, and all, and then we ended up in the, the day ended up at the Holocaust museum. So you spend all day with these people on a bus going to different historical sites and eating lunch and what have you. And then when you're in the Holocaust museum, 
like you're kind of split apart, but you'll catch them. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. how do you fucking greet somebody in the Holocaust Museum? <laughs> like, if you know them, like it's so it was just like a hey, how's it going? Kind right. Of thing. And right. I'm not not to take away it. That's just my own like uh, insecurity and and like uh, un, you know awkwardness of it all. I'm not trying to to diminish the import of the Holocaust Museum, right. but it's but to that extent, how do we how do we make these places places of learning, but also obviously we, we we we're charging admission for them and even the the idea of having a paper ticket becomes a souvenir to something that you and again all yeah. good intentions and i don't know how to fucking balance it out i mean obviously but it's <laughs> but no no but i mean but this this is this is a real uh this is a very real kind of question and i think concern because we do this right we we take these hallowed important historical ideas and occurrences and we turn them into a different type of currency right right not just the admission part but hey look i have a souvenir from this i did this let me tell you about this time that i did right i right. mean or, or yeah you buy the t-shirts i, was I mean he, <laughs> jesus <laughs> um, um but i also he, i do want to say that like but having having those memorials memorials are so important because we have to talk about these things, right. right? I mean, we are give Germany credit as a country for saying we will not not talk about this, right? right? We will not yeah, hold our hands up and say like, "Oh, hey, different times, right?" It wasn't <laughs> wasn't wasn't me, right? right? I you know. Um, they do this. They they confront it. At least they look at it. At least they acknowledge it. Think about, we do not acknowledge slavery. I mean, no. you, you know where I'm going right. with this, yeah. right? We don't. We we dismiss it. We ignore it. We just go, look, it, it, I don't know. I right. don't know. What do, you, what do you want, right? Capitalism, machinery, yeah. things have to get done. Right. It's the greatest, I'm not it's gonna great, do it's them. The greatest country on earth. Well, uh, don't yeah. say anything otherwise. It's right. We've never been anything right. wrong and we've always been right. And, and so, yeah, and there's the danger of not teaching history, right? Because um, we suck. <laughs> but this also goes back to then this idea i think about the kids in this movie and how do we learn things like initially right our parents are our first teachers all we know is what we're taking cues of what is good and bad from them right right how do we get around that how do we like we look at these kids and you're like you little bastards but then it's like what what do they even fucking know right right, right? yeah and the the moment where they're um like swimming in the lake or whatever. And, oh god. And and then they all have to get out because of the chemicals and oh he finds a dead body, right? Well that looks like a, a bone, jawbone, right? Yeah. And, and they go and they clean you know, they're washing themselves because just in case they have the chemicals on their skin. Um but then also, you know, the you see the boy like sneaking kisses with his girlfriend yeah. around the corner kinda it, so it yeah, I, I I don't I don't obviously agree um with the critic because it's it, I just I feel like that is, this is a, a, a very unique take on this subject yeah. matter. And I think it's a, I think I really do encourage, I think this is, and also I think what, what this film does well, and I think it maybe that, maybe that tampering down and putting the horror in the background and not putting it in the, I mean, obviously not putting it in your face allows people who wouldn't have normally been able to see something like the gray zone or Schindler's list still take in and reconcile, not reconcile, but, um, you know, at least acknowledge, um, yeah. you know, and have a, have a story that they, that they can, that they can consume. And again, and not that this is all about consumerism, but take in whatever, however you want to put it, um, without having to, uh, you know, have the viscera and, 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 and exploitative violence and, and things of that nature that may be necessary for others. I don't know. Yeah. I think it's a, I think it's a, I think it's a, I think it's an important work. I really do. I do and too. I think it's, it's weirdly, I think one of the better, I know that one of the, it's really not weirdly. It's, it's been one of the better films of last year. If, and it deserves its best picture nomination. It feels weird in the sense that it feels kind of like one. I, I, people talk about it, but it feels like it's a, like a, almost like an anomaly out of all the other best picture winner or best picture nominees. It just feels like it kind of sits out on its own as far as like a, a thing that exists. You know, I is don't know. It, if is it the heaviest one? 
It has to be, right? I mean, like, I, mean I know of the that power that's like purports to be, okay, right? But, okay. but, but, but it's not. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, look, I know the Holocaust is a heavy subject. That's not what I what I mean. But, no, but I. But I mean, I mean, I'm just yeah. I, it's, I, I, feel I think like, it's the most serious one of all of them, right? Yeah. I mean, it is. It is. I think it's the. And I do think it's probably the most important one. I think if I were to tell people to see uh, one of the Best Picture nominees in 2023, one. it'd be that one. Yeah. I think, well, and it, 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 it does what Killers doesn't. Right. right. Well, yeah. I mean, Scorsese, right. Because again, Haas and this, <laughs> and Scorsese would do well to take notes of this story. Because if you want to tell a, uh, you don't make Haas sympathetic. You don't give him a. You don't give him an arc where he's redemptive. Um, right. You he, know he's not wailing for his dead child at the end. Right. right? To right. sort of gain our compassion. Or, or yeah. Or he. Yeah. Nor does he lose his wealth, but still gets to go on and 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 do sales seminars and still really have all the trappings of still his wealth. Nor does he get to have Betsy come and, and uh, ask him for essentially for forgiveness and a date at the end of the movie. And, and then he gets to kick her out of his cab. Yeah, uh, you know, right. Right. <laughs> so right. fucking. Uh, yeah. I mean, again, I, I don't mind tearing Scorsese and I think it's deservedly. So, <laughs> so yeah. especially with that Chalamet TikTok that was out and that oh I sent my to God. you. Well, but, and that's what I was just right. talking about. Right. right Where yeah. like, you know, Scorsese says in that, you know, he and Chalamet have this conversation about the Wolf of Wall Street and, you know, how critics were kind of divided. And, and, you know, one critic was like, how can you sort of like show this? Or like, how can you do it? He's like, you don't need me to tell you it's bad or tell you it's wrong. <laughs> and, and they're both just like, oh, yes, yes, yes. But it's like, but look, when you make these people so compelling. That's such a fuck you to your audience as well. Yeah. And, and also like, and does the, he not see the fucking world we live in? Well, and not only that, I mean, <clears throat> guys like Jordan Belfort, I mean, they, people love the, and look at the fucking MAGA crowd. That's who loves those cats, right? It, it, he's correct. in that he doesn't, we don't need him to tell us it's wrong, but you can't tell me watching that movie that he doesn't fucking glorify it. Right. Right. He doesn't make it funny. He doesn't make it glamorous. This is a rags to riches by fucking everyone else story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the story he told. He's not telling a story of a guy who has his comeuppance in the last. This is a guy who fucked and snorted and fucked over everyone he's ever known and came out on the other side pretty fucking clean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not in jail, which, you know, forever, which is what he should have been, been. Right. And I, yes. Okay. The real life Jordan Belfort didn't either, but at least at the end of Goodfellas, you've got a guy who has nothing, right? You've got a guy who things that he lusted for are gone, gone at the end of the day, Belfort still gets to fuck people. I mean, Mm -hmm. like fuck people over. He still gets to sell. (laughs) He still gets to sell, sell his, you know, his, his fucking bullshit. He's still a carnival barker and he's learned nothing. Well, and even in Goodfellas, I mean, he's still right, right. This he's kind of like, perfect, yeah. And he's, but he's still like defiant and cool, and he's still this kind of like outsider, even after having gone. I mean, yeah, he still maintained his, at least in his mind, right. The true gangster cred, right. But it's, that, so it's bullshit, and that's the truest line in any Scorsese film: is that my entire life I've always wanted to be a gangster. That is Scorsese to a fucking T. Mm-hmm. And Scorsese sees himself in those guys. He sees himself in his, in his, in his anti-heroes and he can't help himself, but make them sympathetic characters because he wants them. He wants them to be, he wants those bad guys to, at the end of the day, to have a heart of gold and to, for us to really see past all of the, because again, every single one of his characters, if you look at them, they're all guys who are fucking over the system right they're the guys who saw they see more than we do and they don't they don't play the games and they're not we're not fucking suckers that work in day mm-hmm. to, you know a day-to-day mm-hmm. job that scores ac to a fucking t mm-hmm. and that's what he loves and fuck him with this bullshit you don't need to you don't need me to tell you it's wrong right timothy chalamet and your cute <laughs> little fucking face fuck you and chalamet's just sitting there eating it up I'm oh just yeah like, just, oh my god you fucking 50 oh, pound piece of shit get the fuck like have a little bit of fucking backbone, and he and he tried to be. He was like, you know, like consumerism in America. <laughs> Chalamet to me is his Saturday Night Live rapper character. Yeah. Like he, like I really feel like that's how he is in real life. Like he Skirt. just does not. <laughs> <laughs> 
skirt. Um, anyway, um, just a couple more things about this. Um, so Sandra Huller, who's fantastic, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. She initially refused to be in this film because she had said, I will never play a Nazi. And then she met with, well, um, Friedel, Friedel, the guy who plays um, Haas, yeah. you know, had been in something else with her. I, I'm more foo, I think. And, mm-hmm. and so I wanted her to come on and she's like, I'm not going to do it. But then she met the Glazer and sort of like heard him out and, and heard his vision. And she was like, okay, yeah, that I, I can do that. That makes sense. Right. And the dog, the black Weimaraner is hers. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very good dog. It was a good dog. <laughs> it was a very good dog. I felt bad that it had to be with the Nazi family, right. but it was a very good dog. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I will say of all the Nazis, the Nazi dogs didn't choose their lot. Yeah, it's it's worth seeing. So have you seen all of the best picture nominees? I have not have seen, seen Maestro ten? and well, you I, haven't seen Maestro yet? No. I wanted to hear your opinion on Maestro. <laughs> Look, and here I uh, I you know how I feel about movies that get dropped directly to Netflix and like Yeah, and, and, I know. And, well, <clears throat> it played at the Paris Theater in New York, which is owned <laughs> <Okay>. by Netflix. <laughs> also, so. it's also it's a biopic. It's and like it's just I, I'll see it at some point. No, no, no. I, I so here's so here's the thing. Like I, I I have espoused my well, no, that's the wrong word. I have talked about my disdain for biopics. I kind of liked Maestro. Did you? Yeah, yeah. I have to check it out. I'll check and, it out. And here's what I yeah here's what I liked. I kind of reluctantly watched it because. I don't, I'm not sure how I feel about Bradley Cooper as a director. Now I think he's actually maybe good. Okay. Um, this was a different kind of like biopic. It wasn't. In fact, there's an article. There's an essay in the New York Review of Books written by. I cannot remember this guy's profession, but he's in the music. He's in that world. And he didn't like the movie because there wasn't enough music stuff in it. Right. Right. But that tells you that it focused kind of on this relationship and on this kind of on the tension that was there, the tension that was within Bernstein and who he was and who he wanted to be or who maybe he didn't want to be and how that fit in to that familial life as well. So, I, yeah, I really I kind of dug it. OK, <clears throat> I'll check it out. The opening scene is really cool. Um, I just found so, out today that, uh, but I have seen all of the best picture you know, nominees. So um, congratulations, hey, you're one up on. Good me. for me. <laughs> good. For, I knew you'd seen at least nine of them. I didn't. I was <laughs> my was the one I wasn't aware. Of. Um, I just found out that uh, Beverly Hills Cop Four, which actually is Beverly Hills Cop colon Axel F, which is like. Beverly Hills Cop, Beverly Hills Cop. I don't know what the fuck you're saying there. It's going well, like direct. You said, just call it Axel F. <laughs> right. It's going direct to Netflix. So I mean, it's gonna suck. It's gonna. It's gonna. I, 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 I suck. Is what, what I should have said instead of whatever. I, what word I just said. But uh, yeah. Oh, it's, you it's, were it's thinking be, about oysters. It's gonna shuck. No, it's gonna <laughs> shuck. Wait. No, that's not what I mean. Yeah. This is. I just don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I don't know what to. I mean, we talk about like the lack of theater goingness. Yeah. I guess, and I don't know what to. I mean, how do we again? Like, how do we remedy that? I, I don't know. Like, I mean, it's weird to me. I, I, I know it's been a good thirty years, right? Since, or at least twenty eight ish, probably since the last Beverly Hills Cop. So, like, you don't have any goodwill, and Eddie Murphy doesn't has not made a film that would resonate with the eighteen to thirty five year old crowd that probably that would demographic be, that's going to right, the theater, right? Um, so I get it. Although I do think that you could, if they're making a Bad Boys four which we've already said on this podcast that they weren't going to do. And then they actually did. Or I said that, um, <laughs> that if they're making a bad boys for, you could probably, uh, I mean, like you could re-release the first one a few weeks before, you know, and, and that would be fun and then get them to, you know, do a double feature. That one. would be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I, it just speaks to me that they don't have any confidence that it's going to do shit and that they'll, that, and then it, it's just a toss off, uh, film. And I know he's done other films direct to Netflix, but, um, Specifically, the Dolomite one, but um, I don't know. It just I, I just read that today, and I was like, okay, well, yeah. Then no yeah. worries. I'll, I'll I'll see it, but I'm not gonna. But I'll immediately forget about it because. And it, what sucks is that, like, honestly, it, they've got Riser, they've got uh, um, uh, Reinhold. Um, so I mean, like, they've got all of the original characters back. Uh, it should be, and and, and they've got uh, um, 
Bronson Pinchot show in it. Um, so I mean, like, really? He, yeah, he yeah. Was, that was the only character that had any kind of like sexual chemistry with Axel. <laughs> I was also going to ask you. <laughs> sorry, has there ever been a a lister director that has never made a, a a good movie aside from George Clooney? You know, he has that rowboat movie. I don't forget, even forget what it's called. Boy, the Boys in the boat. boat. Right. I can't believe that people still let him direct films. I don't understand. <clears throat> Excuse, like, Excuse me. He I'm must. So he must be really efficient and like doesn't doesn't Does he come in under budget. And yeah. Like, oh, sure. Because no, his movies are like all of them on paper sound like they should be good. Leatherheads. Uh, and I think he like fucks it up. Right? <laughs> I don't think he knows what a good movie I think he can act well. I just don't think he knows how to deliver a movie that is nothing but just middling crap that you'll forget about the second that you're out of the theater. <laughs> yeah. Um, so to answer your question, I don't think so. Right. It, I mean, like you don't I mean, you don't get as many movies as he, as he has with with no hits and and no like because he's done a handful of yeah movies. he did I mean, Monuments Men and uh -huh. like and Leatherheads. I don't he did think the he, Ides of March. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> did he did did he do men staring at goats or was that somebody else? I think that was somebody else. That was somebody else because he was in that. One. But yeah, I mean, it's just yeah, and it's I it's crazy to me every time I hear that he's directed a movie, I'm like, oh well, it's something I'm not gonna go see because because it's not gonna be good, right? Did he do uh, Suburbicon too? Was that him that he took that uh, um, Cohen brothers script and directed that with Matt Damon? I don't know. Let's see. He did okay. The Ides of March. Do, do, do. That was a um, Gosling film, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, all right, let's get out of there. Let's get out of there. Let's look at these. Okay. 11 films. Wow. Uh, oh, well, he, they, did a, he did a golf movie, too, didn't he? He did do Suburbicon. Uh, he did The Monuments Men, Leatherheads, Good Night and Good Luck. Okay. Okay. Maybe. Uh, all right. I'll give him that one. Yeah. Yeah. Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. Okay. I'm going to give him that one, okay, too. That one's so, true. yeah. Um, Eyes of March. No. Monuments Men, Suburbicon. Catch twenty two, the miniseries. Oh, okay, I didn't see that. It was not bad. Um, the Midnight Sky, the Tinder Bar. Fuck you. <laughs> fuck everything. <laughs> fuck that book. Fuck that. Sorry. And then the Boys in the Boat. So a couple, but yeah, yeah, kind of. But even those two weren't I mean, like. I like yeah. yeah, I mean, like I I liked Confessions, but I mainly just because of Rockwell. Same Rockwell. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um. I mean, anything about like junk. Right, right. It's just, that's just a fun topic, right? Um. <laughs> oh, I just, I just remember it like as a kid seeing Jamie Farr on the gong show, mm -hmm. you know, in full drag or whatever. Just right. Like, sitting there and you're like, this is bizarre. This was a different time, wasn't it? <laughs> I wish, and now you couldn't do it because it would just seem like one, we've championed those acts anyway right they're not they're not sincere they're um you know we we and they're and they're done with like mockery like you know you see with uh, with american idol you know how they did their shit where they just make fun of people who can't sing right i mean or like mean and nasty I mean, right right that's what i'm saying fun, yeah just like snide and right right uh but genuinely uh just in you know interesting and crazy and off the wall um acts coming through and <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's yeah. It was a uh, uh, yeah. Do you have a nickel? <laughs> <laughs> the greatest act that never was. Uh, <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't know. I think after that, it might have been <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Uh, you can go like look that up for yourself. And <laughs> yeah, you who you who, but YouTube. <laughs> sure. Sure. YouTube. Sure. Can I have a nickel? Uh, <laughs> the, the Gong Show and the Gong Show. Yeah. All right, um, shall we move on? Yeah, let's do to it. To the okay. trilogy, to the trilogy of Fool, the Henry Fool trilogy that took 17 years to to complete. Where do you want to start with this? Let's start. I let's mean, just jump right in with, uh, with, with uh, Henry Fool. The first one? Yeah. So, so Henry Fool, 1997. Not 
retarded. Yeah, well, I'll take your word for that. That man's a bad influence. On who? What have you done? I've been bad. Repeatedly. What are these? My life's work. My memoirs. My confession. Take this. You ever feel like you got something to say and you can't get it out? Stop and write it down, okay? Am I really a poet? Of course you are. Your poem will make more money than any book of poetry ever published. Simon, the Parents Association at the local high school is calling your poem pornography. The teachers are defending the students' rights to exercise their critical taste and sensibilities. The county agrees with the church and considers the poem emblematic of modern society's moral disintegration. It is, in the end, whatever the hell I want it to be. And when I'm through with it, it's going to blow a hole this wide, straight through the world's own idea of itself. Mom, is Dad in trouble? Yes, Ned, he is. Who is this person? Do I know him? Okay. Let me start yeah. here. Do you think? That's why I asked. The fucking well, question. I. <laughs> uh, um, Go ahead. Do you think this was a planned trilogy from the jump? So it seems to me. So the little bit that I've read, because like we've like you pointed out on this podcast, I'm not a big reader. <laughs> he's he's joking. I'm a big reader. Um, was that he had been working on Henry Fool for something like 10 years, I think, mm-hmm. before it finally got made. And then he didn't want to leave it where it left, right? And so he's like, okay, now what do we do? And then after that, yeah, I think he said, okay, we're going to do two more, right? We're going to do kind of like a three-part thing. So I don't think, a, I think after the first one, he decided to do the two, the two others. I don't think he conceived it as a trilogy, a trilogy. from the jump. Right. Yeah. But I think, you know, as he got into Henry so Fool, like, then it was like, like Lucas, when he was d- developing Star Wars, he had too much of a story to tell. So he just, it, but he broke it up. It's exactly piece. the same thing. <laughs> and just like that, Hal Hartley retained the toy rights for uh, Henry Fool. That's how he made all of his money. <laughs> <laughs> the Henry Fool action oh figures God. were huge. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Oh, I'm sorry. We're sold out of the Henry Fool Confessions action figures, right? The books. <laughs> Do you have the life-size Woodside Queen? basement <laughs> right the place set <laughs> the basement apartment place set <laughs> do, do, you have, do, do squatters rights come with that <laughs> <laughs> can, can i get kevin corrigan's right, kevin crack Cor- pipe <laughs> <laughs> kevin corrigan with real slapping action just like <laughs> Uh, the toys uh, we would make so so yeah i mean i think i think that's kind of how it how it came out and then i mean I, you know obviously the third one is is ned rifle which we've talked about as hartley's kind of pseudonym that he right. that apparently he used in college for a writing class <laughs> <laughs> just like it's like okay like i wonder if the if the professor knew or if they were just like who who is this Ned Rifle guy, <laughs> like, right. you know? he's but doing really well in class. But uh, he's he's great. I'm not sure. I don't. I don't see him on my. When they decided to make the third one, he was like, "I don't want to call it Ned Fool," and I've already you know, Ned Grimm doesn't. Okay, so we're gonna just gonna do like Ned Rifle. Right. So, right. There was that. All right. So, um, 1997 um, stars Parker Posey, James Urbani- Urbaniak, Urbaniak. Yeah. And Boniac sounds right. And Thomas J. Ryan. Um, first film for Thomas J. And or Boniac. Oh, was it for his first yeah. one too? That's yeah. crazy. Well, he had done, okay, I'm sorry. He had done a short film with Hartley before right. this. <clears throat> but it was both of their like first like feature length screen appearance. So good in both of them. I know. I know. <laughs> like- I know. They're both great. So an introverted garbage man writes his thoughts in a notebook after Henry Fool, writer and ex con, rents the basement and gives him a notebook and the idea. He writes poetry, and Henry helps him along. Yeah. <laughs> that's basically, that's it. Yeah, that's the storyline. That's it. <clears throat> uh, 
Yeah. And, you know, so revisiting all of these again um, now, uh, yeah, hit full holds up. I mean, it's, it's still awesome. It is so and, charming. Yeah. Yeah. It is. I mean, it like it exists in a world that doesn't exist, obviously. And like, we keep talking about like heart. This is a movie that has five <laughs> characters in it and they're, and, you know, and they all revolve around one another. Um, and, and they're all kind of in different movies, but the same <laughs> one. Right. Right. Well, and the progression of Faye across the three films, she's not in, 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 in none of her performances are completely different in every single film. Four days. Well, it took her four days to do her part in Henry Fool. That's crazy. So she shot her scenes in four days. Parker Posey did. <laughs> she's a goddamn treasure, man. That's a, this is her best role. Yeah, I think so. Ever. Yeah. Ever. It, because this is, <laughs> and I, you know, again, going back to like, again, Ebert doesn't get any of these films. He gives Henry full a, a thumbs up and two and a half stars. And that's as good as it's going to get. Cause he, he doesn't see Ned rifle. He doesn't make it to see Ned rifle, but, uh, oh, right, right, right. um, <clears throat> but, the and and but he still laments. He's like, I don't get it. Like I, I, I'm, I think I'm supposed to, but I just still don't get it. Um, it's just so weird. I, I don't know. It's weird I, to me that he he. I, I appreciate that he kept trying, and yeah. but it just was never. Well, was that, his job? <laughs> sure, sure, right, right, right. <laughs> but no one was asking him to get to to review uh Faye Grimm at the, at the time Faye when Faye Grimm comes out i mean it's not like i, I was sure that he seemed obligated to do it but I, it, it's just one of those i think that <laughs> like the review of zone of interest i think it was just like i think ebert saw hartley as the cool indie director yeah. that he could just never put a finger on this movie is so sop, so sporadic i mean like it's you know it's just it 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 doesn't like like you said, every move, every character's in a different movie, and Thomas J. Ryan as Henry Fool kind of runs roughshod over everyone. I love you. Don't I? Mean, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe I'm just kind of romanticizing this film. But like, you don't see characters like him very often. These like, um, you know, and I kind of equate it to like the the grandiose like legend of like Hemingway or Bukowski or like these guys that were kind of like live life on their own terms and were like always drunk or smoking or fighting or fucking and that kid and it was just like and they didn't give a shit they just spoke their mind and didn't uh, conform to the bullshit of the everyday life they uh, you know they 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 lived hard and they loved hard and they you know they fucked over everybody they knew but like not intentionally but, it right, wasn't like right, it wasn't right. malicious it was just like it wasn't Jor Jordan Bell for it like, right they like, couldn't be bothered with the the mundaneness of life they had to like fucking they were too big for it right right they had to drink from the fucking fountain man at all times <laughs> just full blast <laughs> and that's what's so much fun about this movie is because again. I mean, it's just so much, much fun about this movie because you kind of follow him and like how he does that. And really the, the, you know, as the real story is Simon, Simon Grimm and his, his rise to uh, popularity and infamy with his long form poetry, uh, which I think is funny too. But uh, <laughs> that, that, that I, I love that Hartley like leans into that. It's such a, like a, and it's obviously such a red herring of the movie where you don't ever get to see any of the poetry, of course, which I think is, it's a brilliant conceit. I mean, obviously you can't tell that story without ruining the movie, right? It's not going to, it's not going to resonate if we actually be are able to read the poetry. Um, and, but you know, it becomes, he becomes this, uh, this national celebrity and also like, and also a, a hated man at the burgeoning time of the internet. Right. So like it's his, <laughs> I love, I mean, obviously, just the anachronism, not anachronism, but just I mean the time frame of Henry Fool like not knowing what the internet was. It's like, is it true you can get pornography on that thing? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like oh, yeah, you can just send nasty pictures or whatever you want. Uh, <laughs> the idea of, of people not knowing what the internet is, so it seems so quaint. But I mean, yeah, it would have been 97. It was, it was right in line with the time. Right, the time, right. So, like, I, I remember watching this and just being, and kind of having the same, like, you can get, like, all this, like, <laughs> on the dial up AOL thing in there. <laughs> but it's, but it's the, the story is, is like I said, it's interesting in the way that we, it's titled Henry fool. You're following Henry fool. And yes, he is the impetus for all of the action that happens in the story. Um, but really people are all reacting to Simon. I mean, it, it, the only other story is Corrigan's story, which really 
is not not driven by Simon. Um, but outside of that, everyone else, the mother's suicide, you know, phase kind of um, collapse and, and they're all kind of driven by his, his, his um, you know, his, you know, his popularity at that point. Yeah. But I mean, everything, everything orbits around Henry. And that's why, I mean, that's why it's called Henry Ford. Right, I mean, sure. Because he is sort of the, <clears throat> he's the moon that's controlling the tides, I guess, <laughs> right. right? Depending. But he's bringing all of these like other bodies then into, into contact. I mean, so, you know, this is what I love about like this film is that it's about so much, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it's about censorship, artistic integrity, or like what art is worth, right? Um, not even what art is worth, but like does good or bad art matter, right? Does it matter if it's good or bad, right? right? And where it can come from, and right? wh- yeah, and 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 who says? Right? But then also you get this like political xenophobia. And like mm-hmm. jingoism, and that's where Corrigan comes in, right? Who, right. who, who ends up supporting a kind of like right wing, xenophobic political? I don't know what he's running for. Something kind like of he's small, a congressman, right? Then, yeah, I mean, he's supposed to or be like the councilman, or they say congressman. Oh, do they? Okay. Yeah, when he's okay. when he's when he's uh, when he's campaigning for him, he's he mentions that he's a, a congressman that who will, will become president of the United States someday. So and loses, right? right? And, loses and then the, yeah, and then like Corrigan collapses back into whatever, right? <laughs> right. Um, Just a drunken, angry stupor, essentially. Essentially, yeah. But what I, I mean, I yeah, it's such going back to what you talked about, like not showing, <clears throat> not showing the work. It would have been such a misstep, right? And Harley even said, I don't know that I wrote this down. Let me see if I can find it. Um, I don't think I did. But he was like, you can't, like, that's the biggest mistake. Like, that's what everyone gets wrong when they show, when they make films about artists. That, you, you, you can't show this work, right? Because then... We're you, judging it immediately. Exactly, right? right? We're in and we're deciding that's good or bad. And then that takes the power away from, from the film. Right. right, and so I love that we don't see this. We just see reactions of it, and the reactions are all different. <laughs> right, right. You know, one woman loves it; the next one like hates it. Right. I mean, it's it's great. Right. I mean, it, he it, ends up it, winning the Nobel Prize. Right. It drives one. It drives one mute woman to start to, to sing, sing, and it drives his mom to suicide. So mm-hmm. it's just this. Um. Yeah. It, it obviously wildly varies of of um how it's interpreted and how it's received. I wanted to go back to Henry himself. Um, Hartley wrote that he didn't want it to be too easy to like Henry Fool, right? He go, and this is what he says. I mean, he's so bombastic, so funny and disgusting. It's easy just to fall in love with this man. So he really had to have been in prison for something inexcusable. And that's where the kind of statutory rape comes in. And that, that is the thing that I think Hartley uses to keep us from getting too attached to Henry Fool or loving him too much. Right? right. But I mean, so much of this film is about influence too. And who do we get influence from? And it's interesting that this ex-con kind of pervert has been the biggest influence on this garbage man that like allowed him to rise kind of up at least artistically right right i guess this also in part was based on the friendship and mentorship between joyce and beckett really yeah um which and that kind of makes a lot of sense if you think about joyce joyce and beckett beckett being more taciturn right more more minimalistic right and then like henry fool's confessions being sort of like gibberish and nonsense right and this is me looking at you finnegan's wake (laughs) Right, right. <laughs> which is right. which is like unreadable. <laughs> right. So, so I I like that. I mean, it's not sort of historically accurate, right? But, but it does. I think bringing that into a different light and that artistic relationship. Hartley says, "I wanted to tell a story about influence, both artistic and personal. I considered this possibility. What happens if your most profound influence is someone whom you're kind of ashamed of, or you'd be embarrassed to admit?" Maybe the local pervert did more to shape your personality than anyone else, or the criminal, or the ex-con. That struck me as very exciting. <laughs> I feel like I feel like Hartley sees himself in Simon, especially as the oh, three films play out. I feel yeah. like this is 
Simon is Hartley and, 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 uh, cause it just, it just, cause if you look at it from a perspective of an inexplicable piece of art that's received one, you know, that is, that is praised and damned all in the same breath. Um, and I, you know, I don't know about the, the, I don't know about the grandiose nature of coming up from nothing and, and, um, and, and then becoming this, you know, no, no more laureate. Right. But, yeah. but outside of that, I do feel like, this feels like him not telling the story of himself, but putting himself in the story. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's also definitely, and, and I want to come back when we talk about Ned, Ned rifle, I have another quote for you, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, but it goes along with that. Um, but I mean, I think there is this idea too of, of Hartley seeing himself. Yeah. As a Simon Grimm who sort of divides people. Right. But, but he was also, who's, just a guy that makes stuff. Right. 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 And so, yeah. And so from Grimm's perspective of like kind of being bewildered that this is something that he just rattles off. Right. And that everyone's amazed that because it's in iambic pentameter and he doesn't even know what that is. Right. Um, but, but so it's like, it's like speaking of like, well, you know, uh, amateur or, or trust is, is influenced by French new wave. I'm like, okay, well, whatever. I never saw a French new wave film right, or whatever. Right, like it's right. just, and I'm not saying that that's the actual case, but this, this is an example. But. No, because I mean, he talked about how, I mean, how much he loved like Godard and stuff <laughs> right, like that. So right. yeah. Yeah. But, but I mean, I think, I do think that there is this kind of, we dismiss people who don't have the right background when they make things right or we call them something like oh that's an outsider artist you know like, what the fuck does that even mean right? <laughs> right um you know if you didn't go to school if you didn't go to art school then you can't you can't paint right what, what are you trying to do you can't do that right you you, you haven't done the necessary what <laughs> right 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 and I, so i think that's part of this film too right and i mean saying the work of a garbage man is just as important as I don't know. Right. Right. Whoever. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean that both artistically and from a labor aspect. <laughs> <laughs> of course I do think like, I think Ryan is so good in this, you know, but he portrays this. It's like almost like he, if you told me that he was like Henry fool in real life, I would believe you 100% <laughs> like, because it's so, and like, <laughs> I know that we talk about these films and, and that they're slices of time. Right. But like, no one looks like fool anymore. No one has that like kind of schlub. It's like, I love characters like this, that like wear suits with, with ratty <laughs> tennis shoes. Right. With like almost like just like converse. And then have that kind of like, mop messy mop of hair that doesn't quite go below the it's long but not long um i mean that was such a 90s fucking aesthetic that like, was <laughs> that yeah no one does yeah. that anymore right and for good reason because you you look silly at this point but yeah. like um but it's such a i don't know a key out of all of the characters because all the, the rest of them don't really seem like they fit in like the like 97 right they're all they, they, i mean they're, they're either timeless or they're or they're yeah. kind of like phase kind of weirdly all over the place. Um, but him and what I, and so also then expanding on that, his ability to, once he gets Faye pregnant and his kind of like gentleness of one <laughs> shitting himself and proposing, uh, and it, you know, accidentally proposing Such a touching scene <laughs> in the, on, on the toilet. <laughs> so he's had a lot of coffee and That's he finds right. out that, that <laughs> he's, he's now the story. We're not doing a good job of telling the story, but as the story progresses, not that it really matters. You should go watch the movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. as the story progresses, uh, Henry becomes a garbage man as well because he's, he's out on parole. Um, and he needs to have a job. And, and, and of course, um, now that Simon, has become popular. Simon quit his, quit his job. So Henry's taken over that. Um, and he finds this little brass ring in the trash and thinks that it might be worth something. It's he thinks like a it's washer. Gold. Right. From. Right. Like he's keeps, and this is the idealism of, of Henry and thinking that he's found some sort of gold ring and, and like, yeah. And Simon's like, no, it's probably just a, it's like a compression unit off of yeah. something like something. Like, like that washing machine. <laughs> right. right? Yeah. Um, but he keeps it and thinking that he can get some money for it. Uh, he in a in a moment of passion uh, sleeps with Faye Grimm, who's Simon's sister, while their mom is bleeding out in the bathtub. She's killed herself because she's read Simon's poems. Um, 
and <laughs> it's he a finds, testament to creativity, right? Right. Uh, he, they he finds out that she's pregnant, um, and she's in the shower, and he comes in and has violent diarrhea, <laughs> and because he had like twelve espresso, right? So she goes out. Like she's disgusted. She's in the shower. She goes as she leaves and she finds the ring and comes back. And while he's sitting on the toilet, she's, he holds it up. Right. Yeah. He's like, holds it to her. And she's, and she's like, like, just taken. Right. right. She starts to hold his hand. <laughs> um, but the moment when they are actually getting married and he's like reciting his vows and he's so like cleaned up mm-hmm. and like, you know, in the moment and trying to, to be a, you know, what people would expect him to be, but actually, you know, he's, obviously frightened and like doesn't know how to react in these scenarios. If it's not some sort of bacchanal of life, it's like he, he has to like take responsibility. These are frightening times for him. And then of course, as it, you know, as we jump forward in time, he reverts back to his, as, as Ned is born, the, the child, um, which kudos for Hartley for picking out Liam and finding that yeah, kid. Yeah. So, because wow. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's great in, in this, but it could have been a real bummer had he been a shit actor for Faker. <laughs> <Ryan Phillip, right? laughs> I know. When he's so different to, I mean, not, obviously he's different in Henry Fool to to <laughs> right, Grimm, but right. but his not even not just his personality as as an actor, but his character, as we'll get to, is so different from the middle one to the third one, right? Right. Which, which <clears throat> you know, and again, I think the complexity of that adds to the enjoyment and makes Ned Rifle such a kind of satisfying conclusion, I think, to the, to the trilogy. I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry. <laughs> you are, but it's okay. Um, yeah, it's so, okay. so, uh, Henry starts to fall back into his old, um, habits of, and, and also now that he's, it's come out that he has this long opus of a novel that he's been writing that's wanted to get published. And he's kind of, and now that Henry, uh, now that Simon's published, um, but his novel is decried. It's not, good ever even simon dislikes it and so the, his protege is now out uh, you know out, <laughs> outdone yeah. him so he's taking his son to the bar <laughs> letting him smoke and drink <laughs> what does he say like he's got to learn sometime <laughs> right right <laughs> um but then he finds out that uh and so faye takes ned away from him and tells him never to come home and in that moment of trying to kind of reclaim his goodness or you know his, his worth he stumbles upon another young girl and everyone at this point is knows that he's been in prison for statutory rape. Um, and her stepfather, who's Kevin Corrigan, who we've seen who's campaigning for the right wing, um, politician has been sleeping with his daughter. And so she and abusing her and abusing her and her mom yeah. as well. And, and he's not his stepdaughter. So, um, but she's like 13. Right. Yeah. Right. And so she offers to, uh, give him oral sex if she'll kill his father. And he obviously does not take her up on that. He goes to the f- father's house. There's a big, huge fight that breaks out. And um, he accidentally, st- well, he doesn't accidentally, he stabs him with the, in the neck with the, or in the heart, I guess, with the yeah. screwdriver as they're fighting. And so now he's on trial for manslaughter. And uh, so Ned goes, no, this is not, no, um, yeah, Ned goes to find him. And goes to find goes, Simon. Goes to find Simon. To help, to come help Henry, um, and Simon allows him to take his passport as he's about to go accept the Nobel Prize <laughs> in Stockholm. He puts uh, Henry on the flight instead, and so we end the movie with a really kind of a did he didn't he get on yeah, the flight? Yeah. So you see him going and running towards the airplane, and then ha- having this moment of crisis of conscience, and and then you see him running again, but you don't know. The way that the camera situated, you just see Henry as he's running, yeah. and that's the end of the film. Yeah. But uh, so I want to go back to um, Henry's book because he describes it best. <laughs> my life's work, my memoirs, my confession. It's a philosophy, a poetics, a politics, if you will, a literature of protest, a novel of ideas, a pornographic magazine of truly comic book proportions. It is, in the end, whatever the hell I want it to be, and when I'm through with it, it's going to blow a hole this wide straight through the world's own idea of itself. <laughs> the the dial- yeah. yeah, the di- I, I do think this is like, I, you can tell, this is a culmination of, of everything that Hartley's been trying to kind of work to at this point. Which again, which makes kind of like things like Flirt and, and some of the things that kind of the offshoots is a little... Um, <clears throat> 
I don't know. You, it, it just seems like it's a, a distraction from the big picture of him getting to Henry Fool. Well, it's like him working through it, right? Yeah, but I, I mean, feel it's like, like I have to do this before I can do this. But I feel like, well, I, maybe I don't feel like the the themes and the ideas and flirt really ever go anywhere in the, outside of his other work. Yeah, which is maybe saying that's fine. Maybe it was an itch he needed to scratch. Yeah, right? and, and maybe it was what he was afforded to do at the time. <laughs> but I feel like you know. Uh, the previous films all were kind of leading up to this because this is, I mean, this is his longest film. This is his most grandiose film. Um, and I think it's his, I think as a whole, it is, <clears throat> the, it is by far um, the best work that he's, that he, that he does and has done. I mean, like, so it's, I, it just feels to me like this is the movie that he had brewing is when he started sure. making movies and, and so, like all of everything else was just a precursor to, and I'm, you know, it was a little precursor, but it was a precursor to getting to this this movie. Because again, we talk about like there are really only you know ten characters in this movie, and they're still in New York, and but it's, they still circle around one another, right? Um, and so all of the trappings are there, but the the dialogue is crisper here. The the and the fact that he got those two actors in their first in their real first real full fling, um, their feature length films to to really just kill it I, is is amazing. <clears throat> uh, they were both in, they were both in plays by Richard Foreman, mm-hmm. who's I don't I don't I'm not overly familiar with his work. I know yeah, he's yeah. a little more kind of experimental. A little, I mean, he. What was the name? Oh my god, he has a like theater company or theater, and it's something like the. A hilarious ontological i don't know i mean right, I, right. I, I know that ontological is in the, the title <laughs> so you're like okay that tells you something but um uh he w- hartley saw ryan in a play called something like a head like a hammer right and that's where he was like oh that guy <laughs> <laughs> but urbaniac had worked with um foreman as well so i i mean I, it, it feels like those guys coming from that kind of field would slot nicely into Hartley's world. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's, I, it's weird, <clears throat> but I think it's important that it wasn't Martin Donovan or Burke or it, I, I, I do think that it's, it was good to get out of that wheelhouse and stable of characters. And I know you, he'd worked with um, Posey before, but only in a, in a kind of really glorified cameo pieces. I mean, like, Amateur, she's in it, and I mean, flirt. She's amateur. She's in the. Um, she's just. She just. She's in it for a second. This mean, is just for a second, yeah, and then she's, and then in, she's in flirt for a just second. The first, really. yeah, right. yeah, just that kind of opening scene. Right. She's and the and person she's who leaves, right? Yeah. yeah so, yeah. Um, and Posey is the art house woman du jour at this point. I mean, right. and, and, right. and and for good reason, right? I mean, yeah. so. Um, I'm always surprised when Corrigan shows up in things because I, I feel like he should be a bigger actor than he is. Um, <laughs> and then and he's like, always such <clears throat> like delight, even as gross as he like is in so many things he's into. You're just like, right. I'm so excited. He's here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, <clears throat> it was a, it was an interesting cameo from Rachel minor as well. The, in the, in the library, I was like, I could, I, it took me a minute to place her. Um, another, another actress who hasn't done I, I, a lot really yeah. since bully. And I mean, I, you know, bullies it's the right, ones that's right, like, right. Obviously, well, I know, you know, she was a lot of in the public, public eye because she was married to Macaulay Culkin for mm-hmm. a minute. Mm-hmm. I mean, then Bully is such a a heavy role that it I can see where it's kind of hard to get out from underneath that kind of, um, <laughs> that portrayal. Yeah. Uh, but I, you felt like, um, you felt like th- those types of movies should catapult these kids to like being, you know, doing at least getting in the eye of other casting directors and stuff and things like that. She was really good. And I mean, I, you know, that, that was a, it was a hard, it had to have been a hard role to do. I can't imagine working for Larry Clark. Is I any can't, sort of no, like no, right. I was going to say like, I can't imagine that anybody had a great time. Right. That. It just, I mean, look, I, I don't know when the last time you watched bully was, but I have not been able to watch it like ever again. And I, I know like, didn't they just put like a new, somebody just did a new 4k, I think edition of bully. Or it's coming out soon. Uh, I don't know. They're doing a steel book. <laughs> <laughs> but some, um, I know somebody did. <laughs> I've watched it a lot just because, again, I went down those rabbit holes of like mm-hmm. trying to figure out the real story. And then the whole right, like, right. Um, 
was Lisa the mastermind or was uh, the two men essentially. Um, so yeah, I, I've, I, it is a, it's obviously a difficult watch and it's, uh, it's been I mean, Leo Fitzpatrick. I mean, um, who's in Fagrim, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, and I mean, Leo Fitz, Fitzpatrick is always going to be Sully, right? From kids. <laughs> right. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. It's There's just, no way for that to not no, be the case. Right. I mean, um, <laughs> yeah, always going to be. <laughs> You want to move on to Fagrim? Yeah, I mean, okay. like, I, don't have I mean, look, like, I, I could talk about this stuff forever. Can we just say that um, nine hundred thousand dollar budget for for Henry Fool, um, set in Woodside, but won the best screenplay at uh, at Cannes in ninety eight. Yeah, right. Um, and it's surprising too. I mean, just because this this it really is pretty esoteric. I mean, it's not like it's this as we were getting into this. Obviously, Fagrim to me starts to feel more like a Mehmet film in a sense, not in the stilted dialogue, but this is, so it's a weird like mixture where Henry Fool still feels more like a Mehmet dialogue well, and Faye that. Grimm feels more like a Mehmet kind of, and it, obviously I think it, I wouldn't ever call them the same thing no. because they're, because Mehmet has a seriousness to him that almost <laughs> like, well, the, well this is okay. So this is what I love about Hartley. And this is what I love about Henry Fool is that Henry Fool, everyone in this film, I mean, especially Fool and Grimm, are talking about serious, esoteric, philosophical ideas right. and thoughts and art and beauty and all this stuff, but in the most absurd setting, right? So they're not in tweed. They're not at a, I don't know, gentleman's lounge, cigar club talking about shit. They're in a basement, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> One right. of them is a garbage man wearing, that's all he wears is his work uniform <laughs> right and they're talking about these big heady ideas but like so many of hartley's films that's what's going on There's right like serious esoteric ideas in non-serious situations <laughs> right and i love it <laughs> yeah yeah and i you know he treats these characters all with such loving care that it's just gonna that it's that it's <clears throat> uh, i don't know refer like we've talked about this before too but like he doesn't look down on any of these characters i mean like Faye is uh, promiscuous um, young woman and like uh, that <laughs> that I fucking that line she's like plenty of men when they get a few drinks in them think that I'm 18 that's <laughs> I feel like I had written down a bunch of stuff that was said in that film and now I don't know like where any of it is yeah full tosses off lines that are, that are all it's great just, they're yeah. just amazing it's it he he paints those characters and like he's correct you do need it feels weird to say this you do need that statutory rape thing to be in play yeah. because <clears throat> he is such a desirable character like you you want to be i mean like you want to be that's why i find this character so compelling is that it's such a refreshing and of course they're characters right they live in the moment they live in the story they don't have to we don't have to follow them the other 23 hours of their day when everyone, when they're loathsome and they're, yeah. <laughs> they, and they've got nothing besides a, a empty bottle of Jack and, and a one last cigarette, you know, and <clears throat> to, to, to pass out to kind of thing. But, uh, um, but on screen when they're just, you know, doing whatever the fuck they want to be doing and, and not caring again, how the world perceives them. That's a, that's a fucking, that's a desirable state. <laughs> Some of these, some of these tossed off lines. Um, Simon is talking to his mother. And the mother says, it was nice, but it wasn't remarkable. Does that matter? Yes, it does. <laughs> Henry Fool was, I think it was, he was, um, again, the porno mags and Hartley's movies. I know, right? The, me up, right? The whole, the whole like wall of them in the I convenience just, all store. All the time. And I, so it was I, like Henry Fool reading something. And he says, I refuse to discriminate between modes of knowing. <laughs> <laughs> talking about how we can. and then and then when he when when Faye kicks him out and he goes to uh the deli or the bodega owned by the um asian family mm -hmm. and they're having a rock show inside See, and the owner goes gotta have rock and roll show these days poetry readings don't pay the bills <laughs> yeah i felt like that was an interesting uh and like really like because hartley doesn't 
really give a shit if you're keeping up or not. No, right. I mean, no. like there's time shifts in here that happen from scene to scene and fool and Simon and Faye. You know, the only reason, you know, time has passed is because Ned is grown. Ned is, yeah, not, <laughs> right? He's not a baby anymore. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, the evolution of the, of the bodega to a nightclub essentially, uh, in <laughs> went from like bodega to coffee shop. Right. And then to right, club. Yeah. Right. <laughs> when that goes back to like Henry talking about poetry being a fad, right. Or, or the kids loving poetry. That's just a fad. And then that, <laughs> right. that comes back like later too. Right. Yeah. So good. Um, but yeah, we can move on. Okay. To okay. I'm, no, no. I mean like that. We, we, yeah, we could, I, I think you could dissect this for hours. Um, I know. And then just kind of, I, this is a, and this is why like, this is a film to me that I, love from the first moment I saw it, but it would be one that I'm always would be nervous about bringing it to other people. Yeah. Like it's like, yeah. and I can remember where I saw this. I mean, I saw it in the upstairs theater at uh, the Inwood when it, when it first came out. And, uh, it, like I said, it was one of those things that you, I want to invite people to see it over and over and over again. And I'm like, you don't necessarily know. Like I, I can understand Hartley being an acquired taste. Um, but, like I said, for me, this is the world that I want to live in it all the time. <laughs> no, it's just, I just want, yeah, I want to hang out and listen and talk. Right. Right. Yeah. Because again, there's no, like what I love about his characters, it, it, there's no trappings of like, they live in the moment, right? There's no real other like driving force for them. They live in the art and it's, and so like, there's not a, it, everything else is superfluous. They just exist, and it's yeah. such a nice like way to to be. Well, and I love too that like they are not. I mean, no one overacts in Hartley films, right? I mean, it's all very kind of quiet and staid and and serious. Even the Man, funniest lines in know? the next movie we might be. Yeah, I mean, but I, I I'm still on Henry Fool. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, ninety seven. Yeah, I mean, you know, sorry. as of ninety seven, this is all true. <laughs> All right, uh, Faye Grimm came out about 10 years later in 2006. I know, I know what you're thinking. Forgive the man, nobody's perfect, but I do forgive him. I always did. Why would a world-famous poet, a literary celebrity, stoop to help a man of such negligible redeeming value and at such a cost to his own reputation and livelihood? Simon Grimm fans the world over have seized upon this mysterious friend, Henry Fool, and his fabled confessions as an essential key to the deeper understanding of the incarcerated garbage man poet of Woodside, Queens. Agent Fulbright, CIA. I guess, has it ever occurred to you that perhaps Henry's confessions were simply too completely awful to be true? The French Secret Service have two books of Henry's confession. They were found in the possession of a notorious drug smuggler who swears that he got them from Bibi Konchalovsky. And who is that? A terrorist, wanted by the Russians, the Israelis, the French, and us. Fulbright, Henry was a garbage man. So what the hell was he doing in Afghanistan in 1989, for instance? Did your father ever tell you unusual bedtime stories when I wasn't around? Sure, all the time. Simon, you gotta get out of jail. I can't handle all this on my own. The Germans, the Belgians, the Israelis, China. Nobody wants the French to hand over these books to the U.S. Believe me, Faye, this is critical. And you're the only one who can do what needs to be done. You should not have done this. I had to get you out of prison, Simon, and see it worked. We are in love with the same man. Hey, I do not love that man, okay? Faye, Henry's alive. How goes the jihad, you cheap fuck? I mean, if I were a world-famous terrorist. I'm not a world-famous terrorist. Yeah, and whose fault is that? She's here. Shit. You gotta come? No, wait, hold on. How the hell did she find me? She seems to love you very much. I knew you'd be good. Hey, listen, take it easy. A 10 years later continuation of Hal Hartley's Henry Fool, where Faye Grimm is coerced by a CIA, CIA agent to try and locate notebooks that belong to her fugitive ex-husband. Published in them is information that could compromise the security of the U.S., causing Faye 
to first head to Paris to fetch them. <clears throat> this is Hartley's Gremlins too. Do you think that this is also Hartley's, like on a serious note, um, like his post nine eleven movie? Yeah, to a certain extent. For- yeah, I mean, because this has terrorism, espionage. It even has a kind of like FISA vibe to it. Mm-hmm. Um, all of that kind of, I think, like paranoia um, that surrounded everyone and everything kind of post 9-11. Um, I mean, even now, right? I mean, going back to sort of what you talked about like with like zone of interest, there's so much of so much of us kind of watching and ignoring, right? And I, and I feel like Hartley was influenced by some of that with this film. Or like what can be done to someone just by saying, hey, you're, you're a terrorist. <laughs> right, right. Um, I do feel like Hartley's films are soft parodies of the films that were also going on at the time. Sure. So like if you look back at Trust and like even Henry Fool and, and Amateur, they're soft parodies of these hyper-violent indie films and, and overly talky indie films and they're his spin on them. This feels like a Hal Hartley, Dan Brown film, right? I mean like... Where it's, wait, wait, did you read that he kept reading the Da Vinci Code? Oh, no, he was I, didn't. Writing this? I didn't read that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but I mean, it feels like that, right? It feels kind like, of like in an ironic way. But right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I think I think there's I think there's a level of piss taking with with Hartley that doesn't quite get. I don't think that it, it you have to kind of look a little bit deeper to, to gather it because I don't and I don't think that he wants to put it on Front Street, but uh I definitely think there's part of like including the actors that he included, especially Goldblum, um, and having red herring on top of red herring on top of red herring. Like none of this movie makes sense. Like, and, but again, but also and like trying, but neither does the Da Vinci Code, right? And trying to make, for different reasons, right? Too. Right, of course, of course, right. <laughs> so trying, but I think his idea, I think his point is stop trying to make sense of it. You know, just. It worked for the talking heads. Right. (laughs) But just (laughs) let this wash over you and don't start to get caught up in trying to figure out all the details because they're all nonsensical anyway. It's all Agatha Christie, right? It's all, there's going to be something, there's going to be some bullshit twist at the end that, that that throws you off that that you never could have seen coming. Well, at least in this one, there's no like Rube Goldberg machine that explains everything. (laughs) Right. Right. right, right. There's no better fucking mousetrap than like, right. And, and, And it's not overly serious. Right. I mean, like, it, it 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 I think this it continuation and this like um uh kind of glorification and, and kind of of Henry Fool and like like expanding his backstory and expanding his his current story, but how that plays with the first one. So what I love about Henry Fool is that we never really know what's real and what's bullshit. We don't right. know any more about what's true <laughs> in the second one, right. right? We have no idea. And, and <laughs> so, okay, so this is where, like, his confessions, right, that, that um, Simon's publisher chose not to publish and Simon thought was terrible as well. Now the publisher wants to get his hands on because he was like, people want to read this because they want the whole like Simon Grimm kind of like experience. And this right. is part of it. Right? I mean, at this point he's, he's a, he's a, uh, you know, a well-known fugitive. Right. And so right. the, the idea is that it's been, it's, it's Simon is in prison for helping his mm-hmm. brother-in-law escape. And now his brother-in-law is on the lamb. Right. And now, so there's, uh, there's a potential for money to be made because he's got this book that they read at one point and no longer have access to, but, but the um, public wants it, but the public wants it because now he's this notorious figure. Right. Who's, who's aligned with the Nobel prize winning poet who's incarcerated. (laughs) Right. So great. So the publisher wants it for artistic reasons. The CIA wants it because of political, possibly treasonous, possibly spy craft reason, but they don't even know, but they have no (laughs) idea. And they're just like, and also like he's dead. Right. So they have this, Okay, we have to talk about Ned at this point, right? So Ned <laughs> Ned is in trouble at school because he brought a pornographic viewfinder. <laughs> right. Right? right. That was sent to 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 him, right, in the mail. It was sent to the house. Yeah. And he it was addressed it. to him. 
Was it? Yeah, yeah okay, he said it was addressed to me. But it's weird though. She was like, do, do you think he was like, actually, since when do you open mail? Do you think like, he addressed to me? Really was because I mean, obviously, at the end of the movie, they were trying to get Faye to come. So the shop was trying to get Faye to come. So here's the question though: <laughs> Were they really? I don't know. Or right. or or did Henry just see that and go? Oh, my kid will like this and send it off because and see and this is where like the red herring and red herring and we still don't know what's real and what's not right because on the wall behind this orgy written in Turkish is an honest man is always, always in, in trouble, trouble right. right which is something that Henry said to what? Simon in the first it was the first line of his in confessions. the first line of his confession right. right yeah <laughs> I love that they <laughs> they go to like. The three different holy men. <laughs> to have him watch this pornographic <laughs> scene. <laughs> to look like, at the, the writing on the wall. And, the and Muslims they keep like, looking. <laughs> think it's not the words of the prophet. So <laughs> the guy, that's, yeah. it's, it's, it's Turkish. It's and Turkish. like, what? <laughs> and the, the priest is like, is it? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> he keeps looking through. I love these guys like just keep looking. And they keep apologizing. Sorry, Father. For the, like, you know, the <laughs> um. So I love this about Ned, but also like Ned gets expelled from school <laughs> or getting a blowjob in the bathroom from two 16 year old girls. Ned is 15 at this point. Right. And it's just, I mean, you start to think like, okay, he's following kind of in Henry's footsteps. Right. Which is what which Faye, is, Faye is concerned about. Biggest concern. Right. Um, okay. So the publisher wants the book for artistic and monetary reasons. The CIA wants it because they think that it's like, you know, has like, you know, yeah, spycraft reasons. The publisher and Simon figure out that it's written in code. Right. And, and, the, and, the, and the, the book you need to break the code is Milton's Paradise Lost. <laughs> which, which makes sense if you think about Henry Fool as a kind of like devil character. Right, right. right. Which comes into play in Ned Rifle as well. Right, right. And in Paradise Lost, I mean, the devil, Satan, is very much written as a, as a kind of hero, right? As mm-hmm. a as a bombastic, eloquent, well spoken, right, heroic figure to these people. So that makes sense too. And the more you find out in this movie about Henry Ford, the less you actually know about him. Yeah. So you find out that there was before he was in prison, he was in Afghanistan doing work for the CIA, whatever that work may have been. Um, they start to look into and like and so like you are made to believe in this film that really no one is trustworthy, right? Everyone has got a, has a motive. So you don't know if, if Goldblum who works with the CIO and Leo for Patrick works with this. And because they're both kind of infatuated with Faye as well. Um, everyone, everyone is, everyone is, is, everyone is in this movie. <laughs> everyone. Um, you don't know. If Which they're... makes sense. Did you, I mean, her coat and that outfit. <laughs> oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> she looks amazing. Just, Just kind of tussled hair and so, <laughs> and, um, so you don't ever know who to trust, right? So everything everything feels like you're going to have the rug pulled out from underneath you or something is going to be, uh, you know, um, you know you, you're going to have the tables turned on you at some point. So Faye agrees to um, work with the CIA so that she can get Simon mm-hmm, out of mm-hmm. prison so that he can homeschool <laughs> Ned, Ned so, so that he, he won't go to, go to reform, reform school. <laughs> so she gets knee deep in the intrigue of trying to work with all of these different organizations to find this book or find his books. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to like keep this straight in my head and like tell the narrative. Um, ultimately we do find out what has happened. She meets up with one of Ned's lovers who, um, Henry's Henry's lover. Sorry, not that. Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> she meets up with one of Henry's lovers who was a uh, flight attendant on the plane that he actually, so we find out he did get on the flight to Stockholm. Um, they have a torrid love affair. She still thinks that he's Simon Grimm because he, that's where he's flown under. Um, she sells his books to the mob. Uh, and then on the same day she sees in the newspaper that Simon Grimm has been jailed and so she knows that henry is not and is so not is the mob and the mob knows as well <laughs> but the french police come at that time or whoever i forget where exactly where i think it was the french yeah, right yeah, yeah and they um arrest the mob before they can kill her so now she's working with uh faye to get the books back um all of this is just fucking nonsense all in the meanwhile simon is also trying to find the books and uh help out 
And so he starts digging into Henry's past and they could say, ask him like, did you not have a passport? Did you not have a driver's license? He's like, not as long as I've known. So they go back and they find some of the, some records of his the where wedding, he, the wedding, the right. um, wedding license where it says he was born in 1591. <laughs> <laughs> Cause what do they say? Like he could have been like a really like, Hard drinking, hard smoking, thirty year old, <laughs> or right. a well preserved fifty year old. <laughs> right. I love the line. <clears throat> it's like, well, this this is pr- obviously a common like you know uh, mistake. He's, they surely went nineteen fifty one. Does that make sense? He's like barely. barely. <laughs> 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 barely. So eventually, like Faye goes to Paris um, and gets. Uh, gets caught up in um that's where she learns about learns about henry's lover uh and then kind of like doesn't like goes away from the cia for a little bit and like she's in like cahoots with like a turkish bellboy and like yeah. there's there's gunshots and like it's it's, it's all over the fucking place and to try and to Saffron keep up burrows is there like playing everyone against <laughs> right. each other yeah and so trying to keep up with it is really not part of the point but like you said you just kind of have to let this go right right and just sort of because it's layers upon layers upon layers and i'm pretty sure if you ask hartley he wouldn't be able to tell you like what the fuck was actually going and on and also like you said i mean it they are it is kind of a piss take i mean it's 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 a serious piss take right or it's a very kind of artistic philosophical piss take but it is that right and it and you know because everything is in dutch angles <laughs> Everything. Every, <laughs> this every, is like 1960s every Batman. Single like. frame <laughs> is tilted. <laughs> that had to infuriate Ebert. He was just like, "What the fuck is going on?" But here? again, but it's so intentional, right? right? Of course, and it's and it's even like if if someone were to say to Hartley, "Okay, I got the joke," he's like, "I don't think you do." <laughs> right. It's like if Hartley made a film now, it, the entire thing would be in slow mo. Just, just a fucking. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, the intrigue and the nonsense, right? Because I mean, how many think about like how many f- sort of like film noirs you watch and you're like, wait, how did we, how did we wrap that up? That, that makes <laughs> right. no sense. Or like you said, the Agatha Christie part of it where you're like, no, you're making a lot of logical leaps and assumptions to get to where you got to. And that no one else can follow that. So, <laughs> right. right. I mean, so there, yeah, there's a lot of that in here too. So, the the CIA agents that Faye is working with, <clears throat> she's about to go with them in Paris because she's. Um, they found out they tracked this back to a terrorist organization that Henry is t- attached to. This is something else I love about this, right? <laughs> so we get all of this like movement from Henry. He's in South America at some point, and then he's in Afghanistan, and then he's in Turkey. But what happens everywhere he goes is. He's a janitor, <laughs> right? And he influences someone else who becomes popular in that region, right? <laughs> and they be, may become elevated to some extent and have written some sort of like manifesto that everyone gloms onto, right? So that yeah. was the whole thing in Afghanistan that brought <laughs> him to like everyone's attention was that he got this guy r- right to to write this thing, and then everyone followed him. Right? He was like a prophet. <laughs> It's just, but I think, I mean, on one hand, it's hilarious, but on the other, it's brilliant on Hartley's part of, of continuing this idea of influence, right? Of where does yeah. this come from and, and, and does it happen by accident almost or happenstance? I feel like everything happens so quickly in this movie that things like <clears throat> that can easily get lost. Like, I think this, this movie of out of all of them, and I would, I would probably go back to fold more, but this one is the I think is more the enjoyable one to watch over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah. Just because there's you will like in all of the chaos pick out certain things that that just weren't readily present, you know, the the, yeah. the fourth to fifth time through. Yeah. I had a friend like I was as we were talking about this, I was just thinking I had a friend like Henry Fool. I mean not <clears throat> not to the level of Henry Fool, but someone who was he was I guess a work colleague and he was older, but he like exposed me to so many kind of things that I probably never would have like come across. I mean, right. and, and that even, um, I mean, he's the first one that turned me on to Bill Hicks, right. Or certain books or mov- movies, especially. Right. So, I mean, yeah, those weird influences that just pop up. Right. right? He wasn't a janitor, but <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that. The I mean, janitor time. and garbage men sort of hanging out and okay. So. <laughs> 
Um, so she's in Paris about to, uh, they, so, and the, the, they've identified where the terrorist is and, and they're about to be on the run. Uh, and at this point, I think Faye realizes that Henry is actually alive where she thought she, that he put, was potentially dead and kind of just given herself to being that he was dead. Um, but as the CIA agents get in the van, the van blows up. There's a big, huge explosion and they, well, and remember she made that threat. Right. Right. True. But not knowing. <laughs> right. She had right. no idea. Yeah. Right. Um, she starts <clears throat> to follow the pornographic box as, and, and, and look as at it. As one does. <laughs> right. And to find <laughs> the origin of it. Um, and of course she, she does that with the most like obvious Henry fool turned upside down like thing. I mean, <laughs> oh, and it, no, clearly no. that was meant to be obvious and that yeah. no one ever picked up on it, but he has this card that was with the box, I think. And she goes to ask someone about, you know, does well, he it's on the box and she wrote right, down right, the right, symbol. Right, yeah. Sure. And then the guy turned. And so, yeah. And then he's like, Oh yeah, no, you need to go here. And then they start telling him the story about the, which I fucking love. Yeah. It's the story of the fool. And so like, is this fucking name Henry fool? Who the fuck knows? Cause mm-hmm. it, cause mm-hmm. like in Henry fool, he talks about, well, it used to be spelled with an, with e, an e, right? Yeah. Uh, but the fool that, that, that kept himself alive by telling the King, the, the King was the one to have him killed. And he kept telling the King stories with cliffhangers. So the King kept him alive night mm-hmm. after night. Mm-hmm. And he lived for years because the king desperately wanted to know how the stories um, continued. And so uh, <clears throat> she tells him what the, the, the pictogram was in, in the, in the uh, viewfinder. And he's like, yeah, you need to go here. <laughs> and so she gets taken in with the, with the, um, you know, with the terrorists, they blindfold her. She, and Henry's reluctant to even see her at that point. Uh, well, because he's bitching at the terrorists, right? <laughs> right, about, right? About not having his an artistic oven. integrity and stuff like that, too, right? right? Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, then not having the, like, the oven, or he's like shackled, or he's chained, or whatever. I, you know, I right, that, but yeah. yeah. But he's, he keeps just like bitching, and barking at this guy, like, "Oh, you brought me cigarettes, finally!" And just like, <laughs> <laughs> um, it all culminates in a kind of a. I mean, how would you want to characterize it? I mean, it's just like again, more red herring shit. It was just. Yeah. Um, they, they miss each other. They don't ever actually see each other. Well, uh, they see each other from afar. Right. There's a, there's a chase basically. Right. And, mm-hmm. and, um, Henry escapes on a boat and Faye is arrested. You don't really see her being arrested, but the last sound you hear yeah. is of handcuffs. Faye or, was supposed to be on the boat too. And, right. Yeah. Um, and so now at the end of the Faye Grimm, she's been arrested for, um, terrorism. Uh, she's so funny in this and like, and like, it, it, like when the moment when she's checking into the hotel and like the guy's putting his hand on her shoulder and she's like nearly fainting and like you can't tell if she's in pain or in like ultimate passion. And I think it's funny because you don't because well, you see her as a single mom. You know what happened? Yeah. I, yeah. No, I mean like, cause she put her phone. Right. We're right. right. Yes. And it rang. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah I know. I know. <laughs> okay, then, yeah. okay. 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 Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. Cause the whole like, cut scene where it was like her phone her her coat has hidden pockets in it um <laughs> but i do think it's funny that um that character trait from henry fool where she was promiscuous and and, and sleeping with everybody in the neighborhood carries over into fake rim where now she's a single mom and but there's still men throwing them like every man that she she interacts with is essentially flirting with her and trying to and trying to figure out whether they would you know that they, if, if they would, if she'd go out with them or not, kind of. She's thing. dating the publisher, right, right, right. And I, then <clears throat> Leo Fitzpatrick has a thing for her, right, and then like Ned plays on that. He's like, my mom really likes you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, really? You think so? No, yeah. And everyone she meets, a guy on the plane, um, cops, right, the bellboy, yeah, everybody, the bellboy. yeah, I mean, everybody just loves her and 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 just constantly fawns over. You know, it's great. And I think too that it's smart to not we never see her sleep with anyone like we did in Henry fool. And right. I think that that's kind of an interesting choice too, that, that, that it becomes almost more, um, playful or she's almost like surprised by it at times. I don't know. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's good. But I love how she is so well intentioned, but clueless. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's like, she wants to do the right thing, but she's so easily manipulated by like everyone. And I think too, this is like, so many of us and again going back to that post 9-11 idea of we we or even now we see things happening connect this with zone of interest again we see things happening we want to say something we want to do something we have no idea how and we just end up like in over our heads right right, right. and then 
you know, accidentally aiding and abetting a terrorist organization. Like, I, I had no idea. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Whoops. So, I was just trying to help. How is one to know? I don't know. <laughs> um, I, 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 yeah, I, lo- I love all of the seriousness of like everyone trying to, un- and I think that's part of the audience too, but uh, having everyone try to unwrap these stories and like, and really trying to really dig into like almost all of them are then hyper invested in trying to figure out full and like, Anytime we're presented with a puzzle that we have these conspiracy theories where you start to pull on threads and certain things coincidentally make sense. And so you start to like (laughs) go down rabbit holes of, oh, if we replace the verbs with adverbs and like, (laughs) that's what kind of cipher this is. (laughs) All we need is book six and we'll figure it out. (laughs) And then, you know, and it does such a great job too of like playing on, on, um, just the silliness of these spy movies where, you know, uh, Sasha's like, you know, if, if the book has a blue paragraph, hold it in your left hand when you pass right, me. And, right. you know, it's just, I see a woman dropping her pen. And <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, Ebert was really put off by like the, the action that wasn't shown on camera. Like, but it, I think a lot of that was part of the, the, the budget for it as well. But uh, this one had a $2 million. Yeah. Budget. I mean, so I mean, he, so. he, com- he complained about like, You'd hear, you know, you wouldn't see a person get hit by a car. You'd see, you'd hear the brakes and the guy jumping. But I mean, that part of it, Hartley's never going to buy into. They Hartley's never going to give you a straight lace no, action film. No, he doesn't care about. Uh, he doesn't. He he doesn't care about the excitement of that would belie his film. Like you, he doesn't care about the excitement of a, a gunfight. Huh. That, why would you put that in a Hartley film? Hmm. Uh, you would take away from everything that the characters were doing, and and, and it would just become. Hartley's Die Hard, or you know, and it's not anything what he wanted to be right, about. Think about the ridiculousness of some of the violence in Amateur. Right, right. I mean the 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 fight outside the train station that is just terrible, right? <laughs> right? Or or the the shooting of the hitman when when um the accountant has to walk back like four times <laughs> right. to shoot the guy. I mean he's yeah he's never going to give you that straight up sort of violence, right, or gunfight or or crash scene, right. right. Yeah, I mean, and why would you want Come him on, to? Raj. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I do no, think that, like, that's why we come. Well, I mean, that's why Ebert would want because I mean, that's why we come to Hartley films. But Ebert's like, I don't want to go to Hartley films. And I love the Spanish Prisoner, but like this feels like such a fucking like funny parody version <laughs> like, of the of the Spanish right, Prisoner. Like right. even the score sounded the same. Like I kept thinking that man, this this feels <clears> like I'm watching heist or or this i mean either one of those it's, it, it just felt like i'm watching those same movies yeah yeah instead of locking up like the formula right we're locking <laughs> right, up right confessions, the confessions <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah and everything that mamet does with all of those red herrings right i mean the, the uh, what i and just going to the spanish prisoner like when you when they're writing the formula out on the on the on the chalkboard and and as um rebecca uh, what's her name she, she pigeon. rebecca pigeon yeah uh, comes in like Jay's covering it up with a curtain it's, kind of yeah. thing. It's just so that like all that's really delicious and well done in those films. But it's so funny to me that, that when you can have kind of a fresh, like it's almost like Hartley is saying, look, I can't pull that off, but I'm going to like, but I'm going to do a lot of shucking and jiving to like <laughs> make you think that it's <laughs> all, this is all really important. God, can, yeah. Can you imagine like sitting down to watch that? I mean, you know, not that I don't watch these films with serious eyes, but can you imagine seeing that to think that this is like some kind of thriller, some kind of like, <laughs> right. And then and going, wait, wait, what is going on? <laughs> wait, none of this makes sense. This is ridiculous. <laughs> meanwhile, like everything's tilted, like 50 degrees. One way. Right. I know, right? Half the time it looks like Faye's like running downhill in these. <laughs> so great. It's so great. And I mean, but Let's there see. are some really cool shots. Oh, no, no, like, no, no, there, there, there are. It, it, he does some interesting things with the camera. I mean, a, especially like you get towards the end where you're kind of looking up at Faye. That, yeah, there's mm-hmm. some, but this feels, you know, it feels like, it feels like a non-funny, like, uh, foul play. <laughs> you know, with, with, sure, with Goldie sure. on him and yeah, Chevy Chase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I, I do think that everything he does with the camera is intentional. I mean, I do think that he has a very kind of, serious controlled and controlling approach mm-hmm. to how he composes every shot right i mean as in the same way probably as he would composing music that he's doing right this is how it's going to be it's how it looks up here it's how it's going to look there so 
also this movie, I mean, like just just keeping all of the main players, except for the priest. So I don't think the priest was the same guy. Uh, right from from no. from full to to grim. No, but and and then we have a different priest. <laughs> right, 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 right. In that rifle. <laughs> and I love how like once Simon starts getting pulled back into the world of Henry Full, he reverts back to his his, his jacket. His, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I <laughs> it's so good. It's okay. He never takes it off again. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even in even in it's, rifle, it's so good. Um. <clears throat> yeah. This one, like I said, this one's so much more like I. It to me, like I said, it's the Gremlins too. Because what you you just you take it and you just make fool, you expand and you blow him up and you make yeah. him bonkers, right? It's he's yeah. just <laughs> it yeah, so good. He's bitch cakes at that point. <laughs> Okay, that's, so that's no, no, no. I love I I I love it when you say bitch case. <laughs> um, makes my day. Okay, um, Ned Rifle, yeah, uh, 2014. So almost 20 years later. I wish this family the peace, the happiness, and the security it has provided me these past four years, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. What do you suppose he's thinking about me? Keep dreaming, Claire. What are your intentions? I'm going to find my father. What will you do when you find your father? I'm going to kill him. You religious? <laughs> he deserves to die for the trouble he's caused you. You're not going to try and save Henry for Jesus, are you? And what if I am? I did my graduate thesis on his poetry. She's your friend? Yes, I'm paying. He thinks I'm a prostitute too. Now you're the poet laureate stalker. Ex-poet laureate. People want a good laugh now and then, men. Trust me. Good old-fashioned slapstick humor, naughty innuendo, a few well-placed fart jokes. I could never find the right word for how he feels to be with. It's actually more like being inspired by the wind, the rain, a sickness, some other uncontrollable element, demonic. You seem to know Henry better than I do. I'm fun, and I know a bunch of different languages, and I don't do drugs, and... Faye, did Henry ever tell you about the girl he went to prison for having sexual relations with? I'll be over in Erotica if you need me. Henry? Loudmouth. Troublemaker? Drunkard. Thief? Egomaniac. Sex fiend? That's him. We fired him. He didn't impregnate your sister, mother. I'm a friend. He's, he's my teacher and shit. I gotta watch his back. I'm interested in the young woman you've hired to ghostwrite my sister's autobiography. She's a loaded pistol, Simon, and I like that. Henry? Fool. With an E? I'm warning you, kid. Exteriors notwithstanding, girls just sort of can't resist me. free coffee products. Is there? And semi-fresh donuts. Excellent. Beep, beep. What? You're flirting with my father. Am I? He's, he's fun. And she's ghostwriting your mom's autobiography. No way, that's her? She's obsessed with Henry. Henry and Faye's son, Ned, sets out to find and kill his father for destroying his mother's life. But his aims are frustrated by the troublesome Susan, whose connection to Henry predates even his arrival in the lives of the Rifle family. I, what's the, um, I don't know if it was like a cartoon or something where I, I saw where a father was looking down at his son and, like, and, and the father goes, how could I ruin your life? I was never there. <laughs> It was a family circus. <laughs> That's what it was. No, like I said before, I think this is a really satisfying ending to this trilogy. I mean, this is a much smaller scale film than Faye Grimm, much, right. much closer to Henry Fool. But I, I mean, I, I, I like how this wraps up. It loses me a bit. <clears throat> sure. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think it's as effective or as good as the other two, but... I don't think so either. I think 
So we find out in this one. So cutting to the story, right? Um, Faye is in prison for life uh, because she is branded a terrorist, even though it's mistakenly branded a terrorist after the events of Faye Grimm. But that's what I said earlier. Like Goldblum was just like, just have her arrested, have her picked up right, right. when she gets back. Right. But, but, but that again, like is such a post 9-11 thing, right? Where yeah. anyone who sort of crosses a line can just be held right without well, we're held, we're holding you under the sort of you know Patriot Act, or whatever, so we don't have to give you a reason, <laughs> right? And she's seemingly making the best of it. She started a book club. She's doing yoga, um, and since they're going to be there for a long time, <laughs> she's reading really long books. <laughs> <laughs> War and Peace, Don Quixote. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have, well, yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Um, and so Ned is in the witness protection program until he's 18. And so he's about to turn 18 and he's been living in, uh, with this priest essentially. I guess he's a pastor technically because right. he's married with kids. True, true, true. So he's not the, uh, the other two. I was going to, I had this written down, but I was like, is Hartley Catholic? I don't know. I don't know either. Um, but cause the other two, the, the priests and Henry fool in Henry fool and Faye Grimm, they were priests in this one. He is like a, you know, Christian pastor. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Um, whatever priest can have kids. And now he's, we first see him he's and chased. he's chased. Yeah, he's, he's chased. <laughs> it's like, uh, Forget about those like <laughs> bathroom blowjobs. Blow jobs, right. Yeah. He's a born again virgin. <laughs> um, he's actually building a, um, a crucifix out for outside of the church. And essentially, um, like I, they talk about, why are they talking about Faye at the beginning of the movie? Like she's going to get out of prison. She was in the news for something, and I forget. Oh, and then she was transferred. Oh, okay, that's yeah. right. She was transferred yeah. to a, to from a to a, like a, a regular, person mm-hmm. to a regular person. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. right. Okay, that makes sense. And they're talking about her like she's a piece of shit, like that yeah. she's a whore and that she's a traitor and a terror. And like, um, and so Henry, uh, Ned, sorry, um, decides to once he's 18, he's going to go and um, go find Simon and he's going to kill Henry fool for ruining his mom's life. And so he decides to leave the home that he was, you know, in um, even though his, um, the minister's daughter puts a naked picture of herself in the Bible that they give him as a gift. So good. (laughs) Uh, His reaction to it is just (laughs) right. Perfect. And so he goes to find Simon and Simon's no longer a poet. Um, he's now trying to be a stand up comedian. Um, and he's got a video blog that he does on a daily basis, uh, that no one really likes, but, um, and then one guy from Seattle continuously, like, like just denigrates him. For right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, he's being taught comedy by Lloyd Kaufman, which was really shocking. <laughs> no, to me. I, I know. Like, Wait a minute. No. I think I looked at that. I was like, is that uh, Lloyd Kaufman? <laughs> think funny. Yeah. Uh, in a really bizarre, I, I, if he, Kaufman ever comes back to like weird Wednesday or back through town, I've got to ask him how he got involved with yeah. Hal Hartley's <laughs> Ned rifle. Um, but, Maybe he invested in the Kickstarter. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> yeah, maybe like a well, yeah. It's what, from what I understand of trauma, I don't know if anybody has enough money to invest in anything. But uh, no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, Ned goes to Simon, to thinking that he knows where Henry is. Henry's the one who's been bad mouthing him on his video blog, so he does <laughs> think that he knows where he is. He's in a hospital uh, in Seattle. He he actually because he had signed up to do experimental drugs. Um, or to do de- experimental drug testing and he had a bad side effect, but he can't sue them. Um, but he'd been seeing things. So he's no longer so he's really like, the person that he once really, really once was. Um, he goes into, into Simon's apartment complex or it seems to be like, it's so hard. It's like a, you know, a, a building that has a, a doorman. It's almost like a really long term hotel. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, or I mean, I, I, you know, it reminded me kind of like of the Chelsea yeah, hotel, yeah, right. Yeah, Where, yeah. You could be a resident, but then there were also like rooms to rent. Right. You know, um, in the lobby, there's a young woman. Uh, and so Did I all- tell you, I stayed in the Chelsea before it went like all condo and stuff. No, it was fucking awesome. Was it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I like we were going on a trip in New York and we were, we were staying in the city and I said, well, we'll look, they're getting ready to like revamp this and, 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 and do different things. So I'd like to go see it. And so let's stay there. And so <clears throat> stayed in. 
I mean, you know, walked up the stairs, saw like all the art still sort of hanging there because, yeah. you know, artists would you know pay rent with, with art. Still lots of long-term residents hmm. when I was there. Um, Steve Martin and Martin Short. Yes, yes. They were, uh-huh. The people just like that. <laughs> <laughs> we stayed in a suite where Madonna actually shot some of her sex book in. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. um. With the, the sheets clean there. Um, you haven't changed it. Oh, before. I didn't. I didn't care. <laughs> um, in fact, I hope not. Because <laughs> right. that was the, well, that was the whole aesthetic. I mean, like, you know, the radiator clanged me awake all night long. <laughs> there were people arguing down the hall, and there was a hole in the drywall. Right. <laughs> so it was. I mean, it was. But it was perfect. Right? That was it was. It was exactly. Banana. You know what? What you wanted to see? This kind of, you know, place that was still a little run down from when you know artists who couldn't afford other places you know lived in right um i did tell the the doorman when he told me that i told him i'd let him know if it was conducive <laughs> he was shocked that i said that to him i'm like you just told me that the room we're staying in was in this book and i make a comment back and you're shocked <laughs> right okay buddy i'm like weird but um yeah no it was it was really cool. anyway so that book came out when i was in high school um because I remember reading it my freshman year. So a good dude had it at my freshman year of college and was reading. That's my one. I wish like literary lament is I wish I had a bought that yeah. book when it was new. Yeah. Um, it do was you have to- justify my love playing in your I, head right I now do, too? Cause yeah. I do too. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> also the video and the Wayne's world yep, video. In the Wayne's, too, yeah, right. the two, the both of them. Um, yeah. It was a notorious book to like keep in good condition if you took it out of its like, cause it was a metal bound book. Yeah. Um, so like any sort of like <laughs> opening and closing, it was bound, was bound to keep, to, to <laughs> getting, uh, fuck uh, it up. Um, but, but there's another like pun in there. Right. I know. Right. Uh, <laughs> I remember Daddy, Big Daddy Kane was in that book and Vanilla Ice. And uh, yeah. I mean, I remember liking it. I mean, it was, look, it was, I mean, I was 18 when I read it, so it was titillating and, and, um, but it wasn't, <clears throat> I don't know. Like, I think it was overblown, obviously. Well, it was 90 what? 92 yeah, so of course, right. of course it was of course it was right but i mean because like i mean think too 91 92 i mean we're in the midst right of the aids crisis as well true so anything about sex is well that's just filthy you right. Can't, right right i mean straight or gay doesn't matter right? it's just no we can't look at that i mean we're, <laughs> we're post we're just post bush we're all like worried that slick willy is a is having affairs with everyone yeah we'd still be which i, I mean i yeah, guess we're still with we're still bush, with aren't bush, we? yeah 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 because yeah. yeah. clint is not until 93 um, right so yeah well i always forget the like inauguration uh, <laughs> right right you know. right <laughs> but i mean we are transitioning into that but we're still sort of uh you know our, our protestant values so back so. to the movie. Uh, <laughs> there's a young woman in the lobby who's become who's basically stalking uh, Simon Grimm. She's a, she's written her uh, dissertation, dissertation on him, um, on all of his poetry. She, um, and she's just, she, I mean, she's just infatuated with him and, and keeps trying to meet him. And, and the bell man or the doorman or the desk clerk is basically keeping them apart from one another. Um, and so, in fact, she even sleeps with one guy who says Lloyd Kaufman. Yeah. Well, that's right. That's right. Yeah. She sleeps with the comedy coach. Uh, exchanges sexual favors and then she still, and then he didn't in, introduce them either. <laughs> um, and it, you know, so uh, while Faye is in prison now that she's in this, um, uh, lesser security prison, she's having her, her story being told. And so she's got a biographer that comes in and she's dictating her story to her over the phone. Um, and it all turns out that the girl who's in the lobby is the girl who, not only is in love with, and, and not necessarily in love with, but in fact, you know, just infatuated with the work of Simon. She's also the one who's doing the work of, of um, being a biographer for Faye's story. Um, played by Aubrey Plaza. Played by Aubrey Plaza. And it turns out that she is the young girl who was molested. Was, she was statutorily raped. As we have been told, she was the young girl who lured henry fool into the bedroom by playing on his mini weaknesses <laughs> when she was 13 when she was 13 um 
So when she finds out that Ned is the son of Henry and Faye, then she starts manipulating Ned to go and find Henry, who she's been really pining for the entire time. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, then it's just a matter of this. Eventually Simon figures this out. This is a short movie. <laughs> this is like an hour under 80 yeah. to 85 minutes, yeah. really 81. If you don't take out the, take out the credits, um, Simon figures out who she is and tries to warn Ned. Um, Ned's only goal is to kill his father. Um, and then once we get Susan and once the, the, the three of them meet up again um, and Ned's kind of weirded out by Susan flirting with his father and his father doesn't recognize either one of them. Um, and it's, they're just, he's just using them to get him out of the hospital essentially. Uh, <laughs> I love that. I, I, I can't, I, I just love that after uh, when he's on, when he gets those people to, to, to take him towards uh, whatever town he was going to. And he's like, Oh, the, the, the couple. The, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The couple that's, a, that's, that's disgusted by him. Um, <laughs> he's like, I can't do this to Goober again. It's like, I gotta stop the, just stop the car and get out. It's like, well, we're not do that place. He's like, I gotta take a shit. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> disgusting. And he the gets woman's out. like, Oh my God, you're all. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, Abhi Praza tries to like reconcile. She's I mean, reconcile with Henry. And so we kind of go through that story. I think this is kind of where the film, like, I think the story loses me here. And I don't know what Hartley, so when I say it loses me is because we see this like long drawn out uh, kind of bombastic love scene between mm. Susan and, um, and, and Henry. And I'm like, this was the, you know, this was a moment that even for Henry, right. And I know Henry's got diminished, uh, you know, uh, men, you know, mental capacity at this point because of the the, the, dr- the drugs that he was taking. But like, <laughs> but even for somebody for Henry who lived life to the fullest, it seems like going back to that weakness again isn't really for me in character. And I think then playing it comically um, just really took me out of the story. Mm-hmm. Like I mean, I just I, well, I guess I just lost. The, I was like, this is not something that I that I expected these characters to do. I can see plazas but we don't spend enough time really with plaza to or i mean susan to um really understand like she's new to this story right i mean she's been in the story but she's new to 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 the viewer we don't spend enough time to understand how fractured she is to really kind of then understand why she's been pining for this man right for her entire life the timeline feels weird too because, like, if she was thirteen, she sometimes she would be older than Aubrey Aubrey Plaza. I know they kind of play her a little older, and that's not really that's a nitpicking thing, but right because they, I mean, they say something like, "Oh, she's in her early thirties, doesn't know how to wear lipstick." Right, and yeah, I'm like, she's not. <laughs> right, no, she's not. Um, and so I, I don't know. I, I think I could understand. I, I, I could be on board with all of it, even the, the sex between the two of them, if it wasn't so, like, fuck me, and then, and you know, that's where she, she says, fuck me, and then they just kind of go yeah, at it. Yeah. Um, where, the, you know, they're getting people from the hotel they're staying in coming out and, like, being <laughs> disgusted. And, of course, and then, like, this, this feels oddly, like, not like Hartley too. A lot of the like slapstick where they pull the phone cord out. Like the guy's about to make the phone call to call the cops. Yeah, that, okay, that that was. They pull the cord off and then the satellite dish comes in. I mean, it's almost like, I don't know. It it really, like this film seems like a step back to trust, right? This film seems like, seems like a step back to that Long Island trilogy where, mm. especially because Ned kind of feels like he's in that role. He's this, he is the, nymphomaniac virgin right but right, it, it, it flipped, right flipped right i mean like so now he's this pious murderer right who is trying to do what he feels is the right thing which is completely in conflict with the character that mm-hmm. he is mm-hmm. so I, I don't know that I, it 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 felt i don't know it's just um not it, is, it wasn't in the same vein as, as the rest of the well it didn't have films. like the same kind of vibe Right, right, right. And, yeah. and and even like the rhythms weren't the same. And I don't and I, love Plaza in this role either. Y- yeah, I I feel like she should be better or mm-hmm. more suited to Hartley. Right, right. Well, then she is in this role. Right, you would think that she 
would play they, this would play well but this is something that like i would have given this to like holly murray combs in this case like <laughs> coming back to somebody sure sure because what what plaza does is it's like she plays it like she's Faye in Faye Grimm. Right. And like, so there's a scene when they're, um, you know, they've stolen Ned's bank card and they're just, they're going to, you know, she gives it to Henry to buy cigarettes and booze. And she's like, Ooh, a bounty of, you know, whatever, a, you know, a, 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 right. a bounty of plenty. And it's, he's going out to pick up pasta yeah. that, that how she plays that feels like it's not part of this movie. Like, and it's like she's trying to be in a Hal Hartley movie and, and not doing it very well. <laughs> right, because it's almost like a moment of whimsy. Right. Where the whimsy in Hartley's film are, is almost because of the absence of whimsy. <laughs> right. I mean, right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, yeah. you're, I mean, spot on. It's, it's, it, and for her, like, it, she plays this role too knowing, right? Th- this is not like everyone else in Hartley films are in their like we've said this before they're in their own world right they're in their own movies it feels like susan has seen henry fool and faye grim and she's not telling her own story right she's there to glom on to a character that she's enamored with um and yeah so it's just, it's felt it felt weird to me i was on board really up until the the sex scene and then i just was like all right what are we what are we doing yeah here? when they're on their own yeah. When they're together, well, that's when I kind of, and that's I'm the like, thing. Eh, that's that's not... the thing too. Also in such a short film, why do we ever stray from Ned? This movie's called Ned rifle. I mean, yeah, you get moments with Simon and Henry fool and you get moments away from Faye, um, in Faye Grimm, but there's a elongated period where we're not with Ned anymore. And so I, I, I like the idea of this being a mama bear, papa bear, baby bear kind of story, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and like focusing on this familial aspect of all three of these characters. But I feel like, again, for such a short film, we shouldn't be away from Henry as long as we are. You mean, no, I'm Ned, sorry, Ned, Ned yeah. as long as we are. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I, I don't know. So I don't, I didn't hate it but this is definitely my least favorite yeah. of of the trilogy for sure <clears throat> i think so and i i think i actually do like how it ends i do I too mean, i do okay. I, I think okay. it, i think it comes back around and yeah. saves itself right yeah, i do i do too and i love that i love that ned doesn't uh, betray you know himself in the in the film and he's you know once his goal is complete even though he wasn't the one who pulled his trigger pulled right. the trigger and Henry wants him to do like he would have done, which is run. run. Ned's like, no. And that's the end of the right. film because he's most likely, because what happens at the end of the film is that um, it, basically uh, Henry has decided to leave Susan um, and uh, abandon her again. Like he does with everyone. Right. With, yeah, right. Um, but he decides to come back. Um, but at that point, Susan is afraid that Ned is coming back to, you know, get revenge on her or, or whatever. So she has the gun with the bullet and uh, Henry busts into the, into the room to protect her, to get her because the cops have shown up and she shoots Henry in the chest and he stumbles out of the room. And um, Henry tells Ned to save Susan. So he goes back in to comfort her and to get her out of the room. Cause she wants to kill herself. Cause she wants point. to kill Cause her. she tries to, but there's no more, bullets there's no more bullets. And so she goes to reach for a knife um ned goes to grab the knife there's as well and there's a struggle and 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 uh susan falls onto the knife and ends up dying too, as well and of course ned's blood is on the you know blood, his fingerprints on the knife the blood's on his hand um and so obviously he's going to be just like everyone else at the end of these films they are going to get arrested um and yeah henry wants him to run and ned's like no I'm not going to do that and that doesn't obviously he just says no and, the, and we fade to ned rifle that's it um yeah so i do think the film wraps up well um, I think aside from that, if we had have cut it to a hundred hour and 10 and just like, <laughs> I, like I said, I don't mind them. I don't mind a diminished Henry and a damaged Susan coming back together. Right. Um, but I do think like the, these Susan's not damaged in the sense like in, in this, I don't know, maybe this is a sense that I want her to be damaged, which is a weird way to say that. But like, but you know, she comes from, we talk, they talk about her being overweight and like unattractive. I feel like that's a weird that's thing a to weird, put in there, right? Like, why is that? Well, and it, well, he talked about it in the first 
than Henry Fool. Right. Right. And so it came up again, but I like I don't know why. I mean Yeah, it just seems like <clears throat> it seems like then her uh you know, her journey her journey and her growth is all superficial, right? right. It's all I wore braces until I was twenty six and you know, you could use to put on a few pounds. And I'm just like I feel like that kind of focus again, kind of puts her in a weird light and mm-hmm. it, it's not necessary. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think what we're saying is there are more missteps in this film than maybe we expected. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and cause if you like to take a look at, I mean, the, especially on rewatch, cause I haven't seen this in like 10 years. Yes. Me, years me now, either. So. Um, but so the, if you juxtapose the statutory rape with the scene in Henry fool, where he's being asked to sleep with another 13 year old in order to give her something that's a growth for Henry's character. Right. Um, and so I don't think it needs to be that look, the attractiveness of a 13 year old doesn't, doesn't fucking matter. I mean, obviously it doesn't matter. So like bringing it up, (laughs) so bringing it up at all though makes you think about it. Right. Right. So, I mean, like, I, it's, I don't know. It's just a weird place to put the audience's head like where, Oh, are we supposed to think that, that there was a deeper connection because she was ugly. Yeah. I don't, I don't get that at all. I mean, I, you know, all we needed to know was that that's the girl from, right. That's it. Right. And that she, and that she is messed up. Right. But, and and I don't mean to say that like as picking on her, but she is traumatized with whatever kind of happened because, because there's the, of that and everything else after. Right, because there's a moment where Henry says, it was like, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. I mean like, and that's a, look, it's a, I mean, it's not, it doesn't save him, obviously, but I mean, at least it's an acknowledgement of, mm-hmm. of, of wrongdoing. Right. I mean, and, it's, and there's some power in that. So, I mean, like, again, this, like, just overly enthusiastic, like <laughs> this overly enthusiastic jumping of the bones kind of like, and then just wall smashing, TV breaking <clears throat> sex, uh, you know, I could have bought it if it was passionate and sad like or like like hurried and and like and then devastating but i don't and i don't i know that may not be fitting also in a hartley film but in the same it it would have it would have felt a little bit more true than go go back to henry fool and the moment where henry and Faye are flirting with each other and Faye, you know invites henry up to her room and henry stops and sees this sort of like comatose half you know like medicated zombie of Faye and simon's mother Mm -hmm. and ends up having sex with her right and and what we see there that would be more akin to what we wanted to see because it is it's kind of it's kind of gross and it's really sad right (laughs) right but you're also like okay that makes sense (laughs) Right. And, I mean, like the the character that we know of Henry Fool, like right. Okay, sure, that's okay. I and this it. and the scene with Susan, not to not to belie the point, but I mean, it is overly like pornographic. I mean, like like from a nudity perspective, but just like from a yeah. Like I mean, like that you know, you see them in different positions, and all the positions are are ridiculous. And like, it's also cliche, right? Absolutely. Right? I mean, like yeah. the sort of like you know, sex that destroys a, ho- a motel room, right? <laughs> right? And wakes the neighbors. Yeah, like do better, how. <laughs> Just do better. Look, we have spent, I don't know how many episodes hyping your ass. <laughs> and this is what we have to come back to. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we be- I'm kidding. I love you. <laughs> we believe in you. <laughs> not we in, just want the best for you. Just not in this and, uh, 10 minute segment that you've got in your, in your 81 minute movie. <laughs> right. No, no, but I, I'm, I'm with you that that's where, like I said, when they ended up sort of, you know, in their like buddy cop moment, I guess mm-hmm. I was kind of like, okay, I could, we can go somewhere else now. So, right. Yeah. Right. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to come back to was like when we talked about kind of Hartley being in these films, there was an interview. I forget where it was, whatever. Right. But <laughs> when the interviewer asked Hartley about Simon Grimm doing comedy, right. And talking about this play to remain relevant. And he sort of like, you know, throws that back at, at Hartley. And Hartley says, am I not a commercial filmmaker? And then laughs. Right? <laughs> and then he says, I think mass culture is garbage. 
I'm just trying to save my life. That's my entire business in being a filmmaker. My whole life is trying to save myself from this garbage. And I I love this quote because for me, it seems to summarize like this whole trilogy, right? right? Where making art is a way to deal with the fucked up world we live in, right? A, A way to sort of make all of it palatable, give us some reason to kind of get up in the morning, right? Or as Hartley says, like a way to save our lives. Right. Wait, have I ever told you the James Dickey quote? Uh, uh, maybe. <laughs> you know what? I, I probably have. I probably said it on this podcast, <laughs> but I will say it again. James Dickey, right? The novelist who wrote Deliverance. Mm-hmm. You guys know that movie. Right? <laughs> Squeal, boy. <laughs> he was also a poet. And so this was his quote about poetry. He said, poetry will not save your life, but it will make your life worth saving. Nice. Right. <laughs> and you just ruined it but but i do think that like that so that's where we see guys like simon coming to play in this film right or even henry fool henry fool is not saying like you know what i teach you will save your life but it will enrich you right it will sort of elevate you for you right so that you can make art for the sake of making art Right. right. Well, and that's the whole point of, of Henry bashing Simon online, right? Right. Is because right. he sees him right. basically selling out and trying to become a populist, uh, you know. <laughs> it was know. the same thing he was saying to the terrorists. Right. Fake right. Too, yeah. right. I mean, regardless of Henry, Henry has a kind of artistic integrity, I think. Maybe not any other kind of integrity, right? But he is going to do what he does in the way that he wants, very much like Hartley. Right. Right. Hartley's listening, going, fuck you guys. <laughs> I know what I was doing with right. that sex scene. <laughs> you guys didn't get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, all right, fair. Yeah, right. yeah no, fair. I mean, yeah, sure. no, I, I'm, I'm willing to listen um, to reason for sure. But I do think that, I, you know, I, I would imagine that Hartley knows that James Dickey quote. Yeah, right? Sure. I just, you know, at least in my world, he does. <laughs> um, so think about that quote, everyone. Anything else, Jason? I mean, what else? What else do you want to, anything else you want to get into? This was a Kickstarter financed film. Um, Hartley said that uh, financing the film via Kickstarter, it's exactly like trying to get elected president of the United States, except in 30 days, you've got to convince all these strangers all over the world that they want your movie bad enough that they're willing to give you a certain amount of money a year in advance. (laughs) Yeah, it feels... It does feel like a, I mean, it feels like that, right? Because it feels like yeah. one of those Project Greenlight movies in a certain, they're better than those, of course, but right. it feels like that because you've got a lot of the same players. you got Donovan back, you got Burke back, back, you know, and, and again, and uh, just basically cameo roles. I mean, Donovan's got a Silas little bit. Silas is back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, it feels like it's a greatest hits album to a certain extent. Um, but you know, I'm 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 happy that he was able to get it done. Uh, like I said, if I even if it wasn't um, overly enjoyed, if I, if it wasn't the best uh, film he's ever done, for sure, still better than other people's. It is still better than other people's. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like. How do you feel about Plaza as an actress? I okay. All right, let's see. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I mean, I I tend to like her more than I don't. I don't. I caught just enough of like the second season of white Lotus, mm-hmm. right. To see bits and pieces of her. She was in a bathing suit. <laughs> sure. You saw those parts, <laughs> right? I got Sorry. it. Um, what was the, I think she can be good. Like when she's raunchy. Too. Yeah. Um, what was the, the wedding list. movie? Oh, and then, Mike and Dave need wedding yeah, dates. And then, whatever. um, was there like Dirty Grandpa or something? Was she in that? Oh, what yeah, was that? Yeah. I mean, I'm not, look, I'm not saying that these are great films, but I am saying that I think she can do different things. I think she's much more than just the blank face, stare at the camera, sardonic, right? right dry, witty um, character on Parks and Rec. Right. right that I think right. everyone sort of wants her to be. Um, so, oh, safety not guaranteed. I haven't seen that in a while. Oh, that was the Duplass film, mm-hmm. right? I, yeah. I kind of like it. It's fun. It's yeah. a fun movie. Yeah, I think she's good in that. So I think overall I like her. And I thought I thought that she would be I thought she would be a better pairing. Right. With Hartley. Like on rewatching this, I was like, oh, this really doesn't like work for me. And I'm surprised. I'm very surprised by that. Yeah, it's I don't Oh, I, she's good in Emily the Criminal. 
Yeah, I didn't really love that movie. But I, I didn't but either. I, but oh, I Ingrid her. Goes West. I thought she was good in that. Yeah, but that's still kind of a, a play on the same character, though, right? I mean, like, it's... Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I didn't really love okay, that movie. Okay, keep telling me I'm wrong. <laughs> I didn't really love that movie either. I, I remember that movie we were did... talking about her and not necessarily the No, 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 movie I understand. I okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I understand. <laughs> I'm just trying to play something... Uh, in, in, yeah, I liked her in White Lotus. I, I've, um, yeah, I liked her in a bathing suit. I'm not lie, but, just, but, uh, uh, oh, have you seen Black Bear? I have not. Okay. I haven't. I think she's fantastic in that. Okay. I, in fact, I really like that film. Christopher Abbott's in that too. But, um, I think she's really good in that. I think it's a different type of role than we've seen her play. And I think it's a different type of movie too. So, uh, yeah. And I, I, overall, um, I like Aubrey Plaza a lot. Yeah, I do. I, I, I feel like it's hard for her to break out of that. Um, it's like watching Jake Johansson. Like, it's like uh, uh, you get that same kind of like manic, yeah, the, you know, screaming at the, or Charlie Day, you know, it's you can't like, well, you get in those comedic roles and that's the only way everyone wants to see you. And um, so I think it's hard for her. And I do think her delivery is just kind of lends itself to then thinking that she's falling back into um, her parts, you know, parks and rec. Yeah. Um, but I do think that she also plays into that. I mean, she did that with Scott Pilgrim and, and, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. so, and I think a, a little bit like the com the comedic roles that she has done, what was the movie where she's making a list that she wants to like, she's an A student and now she wants to like be bad. Um, there's an indie film. That one, I, that one I'm not sure. Yeah, that I can't I've remember seen. now. It's like she's trying to have sex with uh, somebody. I mean, it's, you know, I can't, the virginity test or something. I can't remember what the fuck it was called. But, uh, oh, yeah, look, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say that, that if Aubrey Plaza is having trouble having sex with people. <laughs> she was a nerd, right? I mean, you know, you know how nerds are. Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> not to be crass i just mean like look if you're gonna show me that movie i'm not gonna buy it sure 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 uh, yeah i mean it's a, it was a silly teen <laughs> sex comedy type of thing it wasn't like it was like um you know uh well, i can't remember what the fuck about when paul rust was no, i can't pull any of these movie names but uh um i don't know <laughs> hayden pantier and, and paul rust do you remember that movie i did watch her in um Guy Ritchie's Operation Fortune Ruse de Guerre. So of all the fucking films, <laughs> I could not. I tried and tried and tried, and I would just fall asleep. I could not get to that piece it's, of shit movie. It's so bad. I was like, what the fuck is actually going on it's here? It's so bad. It's just, I don't know. I, yeah. No. And um, like, and then and eventually I just gave up because I was just like, I can't, I can't keep doing this. And like, I don't care. Like, it just. Remember when we were like, Fuck yeah, Guy Ritchie. <laughs> Seriously. No, I mean, Lock, Lockstock, especially Lockstock, I was just... Did Madonna fuck him up, like, completely? Like, Man, I don't know, I guess. I mean, I know I people guess. like this. There's people who like the Sherlock Holmes films, but, I mean, like... Yeah, I mean, because they're Sherlock Holmes films. Right, right? Yeah. But, I mean, look, here's... Okay, because I'm one of them. If you say, hey, there's a new Sherlock Holmes movie, I'm going. No, I mean, just because of like the legacy, right? Of it, I want to see what's done, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and if you give me like Downey Jr., I'll go check it out too. Sure. So, yeah, I'm not saying they were bad. I just, no, I mean, no, like, it, it, it's okay. I'm not defending them either. I'm just saying, like, I'm just trying to think of like the last thing that I, I mean, then, then he went off and did, did he do The Lion King or was that not was Favreau? Like, he did another, Favreau. he did another one, like The he Jungle did, Book or something. He, like, no, wait, no, did that he was do Favreau Aladdin? Too. Yes, he did Aladdin. Yeah, he yeah. Did Aladdin. So I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, why are you doing Aladdin? Like, I mean, I get it. I'm sure they. I'm sure there was a a Brinks truck that was driven to his house and was like, here, don't do Aladdin. But, well, that that was part of like the Wrath of Man. Was that? Oh, you, yeah. Did you see that one? Because it was remember. with like the armored that, truck drivers with uh, Colt McElhaney <laughs> and and Statham and Hartnett, I'm, who's become like his new sort of muse. That's what they said. They said, look. These trucks, these armored trucks that we're using in this film, we're just going to back those up to your house for money, and then you'll make right, this film. Right. Once you empty them, you can use them for Wrath of Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what that's. What I am was. pretty sure I saw Wrath of Man, but I have but no again, memory no, of it No, and all. you shouldn't. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty forgettable, right, to be honest. Right. <laughs> Uh, uh, Statham is oh the guy the guy from Medusa Deluxe is in it though the that's guy right with the that's hair. right that's right yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. 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 whose name we just will never know <laughs> right. it's just the guy just, with the hair the guy you, with and the you really all good hair. listening you all know who we're talking about <laughs> I 
I know you all went and saw Medusa Deluxe. <laughs> Based on our uh, middle, the middle, 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 middle of the road. <laughs> middle of the road. You know, it was fine. Review. <laughs> Yeah, solid yeah. six and a half. <laughs> <laughs> sounds pretty good. Um, sounds nice. Yeah, no, I mean, I it's he is one of those guys who I think he had a few films in him, and then then I mean, like it, it then it worked as far as a, it, it, he was one that was able to kind of turn it into Soderbergh level of commercial success, and kind of like then just stay at that, you know middle-of-the-road generic bullshit film. Like, have you heard anything about Soderbergh's new film, Presence? I have. I, I know. I, well, I mean, like, I know it was in Sundance, and that's basically... Um, I mean, I, I've read a little bit about it, but, uh, okay. yeah. I'm interested to, to to see it. I mean, I don't know. The premise, I think, sounds yeah sounds interesting. And this idea of, like, this presence that's watching, right? And And back to what we were saying earlier, what are you willing to watch let happen? Right, or right. Watch take place without. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. So yeah, there you go. You had Soderbergh to like look forward to. There's a new Linklater coming out too. I think. Yeah, Hitman. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then Linklater also did the first episode of a three part documentary about God Save Texas. I think is what it's called. Mm. And he did. He directed a piece on Huntsville, the prison, um, that was based off of Lawrence Wright's book, I think. I don't know. I'm just kind of making shit up. <laughs> sure. Sounds good. No, I heard, I heard somebody say this, and so I'm just passing it off as my own. Right. right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, did you catch any films, Sundance? Did you get any like, I online didn't, tickets? I didn't. Um, I've been too heads down and doing other things, but uh, but nothing that I've seen really... Since okay. American fiction has been, I mean, I, I saw Zone of Interest, and, and I yeah. nothing else has really been um, too terribly notable for me this year. I mean, like, and all the major releases of Suck Balls. For yeah, it. I watched Handling the Undead um, with Renata Renfee. <laughs> yeah, I love her work. <laughs> who was in the worst person in the world? Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I don't know how to say her last name. <laughs> right, I'm pretty sure it was her best. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> and um, Anders Danielson Lee. Um, it was, I, I really liked that. I thought that was really good. Um, and that's going to be, that's being distributed by neon. So hopefully it'll be, um, cool, cool. Widely available. So yeah. I've, I've been starting to see, um, uh, previews again for problemista. So that yeah, should, yeah, yeah. Me too. Yeah. So come out soon. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to finally getting a chance to see that. Um, since you've like, you're the only person in the world, I think who's seen it at, at this point, everyone else has forgotten <laughs> right. that it was there. So n- next time we'll keep on keeping on with Mr. Hartley um, and we'll throw in some new stuff. Yeah. Um, like Jason says, read the fucking show notes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Look, yeah. Just do it. Just, just you read the show notes. Don't, don't just fucking, I mean like, look, I get it. One, we talk a lot. So these episodes run, you know, two hours plus. And so what which, else you got to do? Right, right. What else are you fucking doing? Right. You're not going to, what are you listening to talk radio or some fucking, you just, just the podcasts but, are the new talk radio. But, but as the podcast bleeds into the next podcast, I mean, I get it. You may not, if you're sitting in your car or listening to Spotify, it may just go to the next episode, but you know, it's up Good to you. you. It's up to Right. Right. And we appreciate that, <laughs> but it's up to you to know we're going to give you spoilers, but you know, get out there and see some shit. That's, yeah. that's, that's the idea look, here. Look, the reason we give you spoilers is so that you can go in Fully prepared to disagree or agree with us. You have everything you need to know. I mean, we said it to make your own decision as it, long as it fits with our <laughs> right. If you don't like what we like, or you do oh, like something we hate, yeah, fuck you. I mean, like, it's <laughs> like, what is wrong with you? Seriously, God, take a look in the mirror <laughs> and examine your life. I'm not saying do anything drastic. Just no, just but, examine it. Look, but look, just examine it. The partially examined life is not worth living. You need to figure out where you're wrong <laughs> and how to fix that. And then come back and tell us. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's your homework. <laughs> but until next time, thank you for listening. And keep screaming. Parker Posey, this is your movie. I know I believe a listening to
to Why Does the Wilhelm Scream with your hosts, Brock and Jason. If you like today's episode, do us a favor and rate, review, and subscribe in whatever application you use to consume podcasts these days. You can reach us by visiting whydoesthewilhelmscream.com. If you are in the DFW area, we would love to see you at a Fort Worth Film Club event. You can learn more about those and find a full schedule at fortworthfilmclub.com. And you can learn about my foundation and how we are trying to foster the next generation of film lovers at realhousefoundation.org. That's R-E-E-L housefoundation.org. Till next time. Ah!